Hey everybody, my name is Aaron Gallagher with the Gospel Broadcasting Network. I'm on programs here like Answering the Error and the Authentic Christian Podcast. This is actually the fourth uh, public discussion debate I've had with uh, Trey Fisher. Uh, the first two really focused on baptism, uh, and I guess technically the third one, and then this fourth one, have been focused on faith alone. So Trey comes from the Calvinistic Reformed theology uh, camp, which teaches you're actually saved before you believe. Regeneration precedes faith, is what they say. Um, and then, of course, we believe, and uh, what I try to defend in these positions is what I believe is the biblical position, and that is that a person is not saved before they believe, uh, is not saved at the point of personal faith, but the, the Bible teaches a person is not saved until that faith is genuine trust that leads them to obey God's uh, promises and God's commands. So a person has to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized in water, and that's the point in which they contact the blood of Christ. So this fourth discussion, if, I think, is the final one that we're going to have on when a person is saved, and the next discussion will center on total depravity. Um, are babies born completely hating God, or are they born innocent? Um, and then after that, we may have some discussions on once saved, always saved. So uh, thank you for tuning in. Hope you enjoy this. And if you haven't seen the first three discussions so far, check those out. And also check out our six episodes of Answering the Error, in which we review Trey's appearance on The Cultist Show, which is what started all this. So uh, we thank you so much for being interested in spiritual things. Thank you for watching, and hope you have a great day. All right, everybody. I think we're, I think we're live. I'm Trey Fisher. Thanks for uh, tuning in to the Parish Reformed uh, podcast. I've uh, been having some conversations with my friend, Aaron. I consider you a friend. I just completely disagree with you, right? And you disagree with me as well, but that's okay. But uh, Aaron called me a while back and asked if uh, I'd be willing to go over these topics of baptism, faith alone, and the tulip, all these doctrines of uh, total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. Um, so I said yes, and so we've had three conversations uh, on pretty much baptism. Um, I mean, we've had a little bit of things in there, but mainly baptism verses. And we're about to start on uh, faith alone, so we're going to be discussing some of these things uh, today. So, Aaron, introduce yourself. Well, my name's Aaron Gallagher. I uh, live in South Haven, Mississippi, and uh, I work at the uh, Gospel Broadcasting Network, and I'm a deacon at the South Haven Church of Christ. All right. I'm trying to do a lot of stuff here, Aaron, so bear with me. We got a live chat going, so I'm going to tell everybody I'm putting in here right now. If you have a question with a letter, start start your question off with letter Q, then or Aaron, and later on we'll get to those questions. How about that? Sound sure. fair? And sure. so we're going to have somewhat of a format. We're going to have some mute buttons. We're going to try not to interrupt um, and hear each other out, and so everybody here can hear what we have to say. So we have somewhat of a format. We're going to first start talking about what the gospel is, clear that up. Uh, um, let me see there. Let me say, let me click on something here. All right. So we're going to talk about the gospel, um, what that is exactly. And then Aaron has a question for me. I'll address that. Then we're going to go into a 15 to 20 minutes on I'll be talking about faith alone. Aaron will talk about not faith alone. And then we'll ask some questions for about 10 minutes each. After that, uh, regarding that, some rebuttal time of 10 minutes or so. But we're very lenient on this. We might add some uh, questions. We might add some time. I mean, you know, if we go 20 minutes, we say, hey, let's do 10 minutes longer or whatever. I have another question. It'll be easy with each other on that. Um, then we're going to have 20 to 30 minutes of just asking each other questions about faith alone or not faith alone. Correct, Aaron? Is that all right? Yeah, that's good. Pretty close. Okay, so... 15 to 20. Okay, first, let's talk about the gospel, what the gospel sure. is. Um, our last discussion, I asked you what the gospel was, um, and I said to you, I don't want to put any words in your mouth. Uh, so just a simple question was, does the gospel include baptism? Is baptism part of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Now, I know that, that the gospel is, is good news, right? But the God, when I'm talking about the gospel, I'm talking specifically about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So does the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news about him, does that include baptism or is baptism a response 
to the good news of Jesus Christ, right? So sure. would you like to answer that again? I'll give you another shot at that. Yeah, I mean, if you give me four or five minutes, I'll go through it. Yeah. So you you brought that up at the end of the last discussions. I went back and watched ours, and I've got notes that I took um, with timestamps. And so I'll summarize kind of how our conversation went and then clarify it. So about two hours and 20, uh, two hours and two minutes, uh, I said uh, that the good, you asked me what the gospel was. And I said, what's well, the good news about the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus? And uh, I said, you know, the first Corinthians 15, one through four, that's the central of the gospel. And so you asked me if it was the death, burial and resurrection or the whole new Testament. And I said, well, both. And I said, you'd agree that gospels are good news. And you said, yes. So then you asked me, is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 the gospel? And I said, sure. And um, you, tr you made one statement that said, I make all the places uh, that the word gospel appears mean the entire New Testament. Now, I don't believe that that's true. Um, so uh, I go back through right after that and I say, basically, no, there's different uses, usages of the word. I say, if you're talking about 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, how do you obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? That's obeying the death, burial, resurrection, I would say. Um, Romans 10, 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's obeying what? The death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. So, I mean, for instance, BDAG, the lexicon we've kind of been referring to, that even puts Romans 10, 16 and 2 Thessalonians 1, 8 in that, in that, um, that usage. So that's what I would say. So whenever somebody is supposed to obey the gospel, uh, that doesn't mean obey every single thing the New Testament teaches, right? That's talking specifically in those contexts, I believe, obeying the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, which Romans 6 says you do in baptism. Now, um, you know, you said then, you know, I'm glad that you said it, the gospel is baptism. I mean, I'm just going to say it in certain contexts. Like, that's the thing. You know, I, I never said that everywhere in the New Testament you see gospel, that that's talking about baptism. The gospel is baptism. Um, in, in about two hours and 14 minutes, you would, you agree with me that the gospels are good news. And then I start talking about the semantic range, throw a ball, et cetera. And so I basically go back and give you the three definitions for the gospel. At the time, I hadn't even looked up BDAG. I did after, um, in later in our discussion, but I basically gave the three definitions that BDAG gives, which is, I mean, I'll just go ahead and clarify and restate it now. So let me just, I'm going to start from the beginning. The way you define what a word means, sorry, if you hear my voice, I've had laryngitis, I guess is the official term for it for the last few days, but thankfully my voice is back. So what is the word, what does a word mean in Koine Greek? Well, the, the place that you start with any work, uh, any word in Greek, is what is its use outside of the Bible? So you look at the common usage outside of the Bible at the language of the time, and then that sort of gives you context for how you can look at the book, uh, the word in the Bible. That It's more helpful when you have a word like a paratema, 1 Peter 3, 21, your appeal. It's used like one time in the New Testament, so that's sort of difficult. But when you have a, a word that's used multiple times in and out of the New Testament, you can sort of see when those, uh, how they work together. So this is what, if you look at ISBE, um, it's a, a good resource for looking at Bible words. It's the definition is a proclamation of victory used more politically than religiously in the first century. So in the Greco-Roman world, from the time of Alexander the Great into the Roman Empire, the word was referred to history-making, world-shaping reports of political, military, societal victories. The Priene inscription, I mentioned that last time, uh, shows us this was something used to announce victories of Augustus Caesar. I'm not going to read the Priene inscription, but it's dated to about 9 BC, uh, and it's literally called the Gospel the Evangelion of Caesar Augustus. And it's the good news of him taking over as emperor. And it talks about how he's, you know, the savior of the world, all these things really that sort of parallel Mark 1.1. 1, 1. And so that's the way the world, word was used, you know, outside of, uh, in, in basically the Greco-Roman world. So when you take that into the Bible, you sort of see Mark 1.1, 1, 1, it's aimed at proving that Jesus is the king, not the Caesar of Rome, right? So, Basically, if you were to go, I've got more I could, if you want to get a good definition, go read ISBE, okay? Um, International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, that's what it stands for. There's a whole, a whole bunch uh, more information about the family of words uh, or the noun form. But basically, BDAG <clears throat> gives three, usage, uh, three usages, which I would agree. I would say we both agree because we both talked about them last time. Number one, God's good news to humans or just good news in general. Mark 115, you use that, uh, repent and believe uh, in the good news, the gospel. Well, the death, burial, resurrection hasn't happened yet, right? Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, that's where it's the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, confirmed by witness testimony. Um, the second definition BDAG gives is details related to the life and ministry of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. And the third definition is a book dealing with the life and teachings of Jesus, a gospel account. So 
is the bapt is baptism a part of the death, burial, and resurrection? I'm fine with it being a response, like we said last time. But I would say belief has to be a response too. You know, in Mark 16, 15, and 16, go into the world and preach the gospel. And what are the responses? He that believes and is baptized will be saved. So I don't have an issue with that. Uh, Acts 15, 7 says that they heard the, the word, of, they were to hear the word of the gospel and believe. So believe is a response there. Um, so Romans 10, 16, you must obey the gospel. That's your response to the good news. So uh, I don't know if you want any more than that. Um, no, that's I, good. I feel, okay. So, yeah, so baptism, that's good. That's, I'm glad you cleared that up, that baptism is a response to the gospel. Sure, okay? yeah. Um, that's good. All right, so you had a question for me. So let's just be clear, baptism, we, you agree. I, I think it's it's a response. You say it's a response. That's good. So just want to clear that up that the gospel is not the death to of the first of Jesus and baptism. The, to the yeah, to the first definition, the definition of the death, burial, resurrection, that good news. I'd say baptism's a response, the same way belief is a response. If if we're talking about that first definition. If you're talking well, about the yeah, third I mean, I'm, I'm look, I'm with you. The, the gospel that's of Jesus Christ, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the content of that gospel is the story of him and what he did and what he accomplished. I mean, I could say, you know, you, you deposited a hundred bucks in my account. That's gospel. That's good news, right? But it's not the good news of Jesus Christ, right? So that's good. It's a response. We're good. Now you had a question for me concerning something I said last time we, we talked. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted you to clarify a statement you made in your closing, um, in your closing statement of discussion number three, you basically, I guess I'll frame the question. You can have time to respond to it. Um, you basically said John wrote this book, talking about the book of John, in about 85 to 90, 50, 60 years after 33 AD. Mm -hmm. And then you said, Did everybody have this book? No, they didn't. And then um, you read oh, John. Wait, wait, wait. wait slow right. I said, what now? Nobody had the book? Or what? You, basically said, you said, did everybody have the gospel of John in, in 90? And you said, well, no, they didn't. So the context was, it, it was your closing of, you know, what do you need to do to be saved? And I think the argument you're making for context was, you know, John 20, 30 and 31 says these things I've written so that you might believe. Uh, and your the argument was, well, hey, look, like, you know, in, like, let me, this is the, this is, the, I guess will help. You read John 20, 30, 31 and said, you know, John was written in 90 AD. In 90 AD, everyone doesn't have a Bible. They don't have the whole thing. They don't have all the New Testament writings. They don't have Acts. And then you said something about he that believes in his, is baptized. And then the statement, I guess, was, hey, in 90 AD, they didn't have all the New Testament writings. And then you said the whole Bible wasn't compiled until 400. They didn't have Acts. Therefore, are they lost? So I was kind of, I guess, wanting you to clarify that statement of, well, hey, they didn't have the Bible until 400. Therefore, mm -hmm. you don't have evidence that they had Acts or the Gospels, etc. Yeah, I try to stay with you on that. But as far as trying to understand what you're saying. So yeah, I would say that, yeah, yeah. John was written 85 to 90. Um, Acts was written, here's my point. Acts was written, what is it? I have it somewhere here, uh, 62, okay? Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of other books, like Galatians was written in around 55, uh, Corinthians, you know, things like that, written before. My point was, if the gospel is the New Testament, right? Because you know that some people have said that, right? Do you agree with that? People, some people say that the gospel is the New Testament. Well, B, I mean, BDAG says the third definition is, you know, is basically the new the gospel accounts. That's not the, the gospel accounts, right? The gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay. So my point is that's the gospel accounts, capital G gospel. But my point okay. was, if we're going to say that the gospel is the whole New Testament, as far as what we have today, then my goodness, like that wasn't compiled. The whole Bible wasn't compiled until about 400. You know, if we want to get into all the councils of when they put things together, as when they compiled it all, right? But we know pretty confidently around the end of the 300s, 400s is when they compiled the whole Bible. So I was just saying, if we're going to say that the Bible is the gospel or if the New Testament's the gospel, that's wrong. That that would be horrible because then, then all of a sudden people had no chance of being saved because they didn't have the whole New Testament. They didn't have the whole Bible until about 400. And then only the people who had it could be saved because you have to have that. So that was my point. Uh, does that answer your question at all? Yeah. I mean, that, that, I mean, that's, you're basically confirming what you said. Can I have like a, maybe a minute or two to respond to that idea? 
Sure. Let me give you, look at this cool thing I got right here. Bam. Timer. Go for it. All right, two minutes. So basically the argument that you made before and now is that they didn't have the Bible compiled till 400. I think you're probably referencing like Codex Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Those are mid fourth centuries, like 350. Some people say 325, some say later, um, which is basically the first time they were put into one book that we have that still exists. I mean, but scripture tells us that they were circulating early. Colossians 4.16 says about Col the Colossian letter, when this epistle is read among you, see it's also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea, which was likely, it says from Laodicea, not the Laodicean epistle, which means probably Ephesian. So I guess what I'm saying is like in the first century, they're circulating these things. So they had the scriptures early. Just because the earliest codex we have is from 350 doesn't mean they didn't have the whole New Testament. In fact, they also had miraculous gifts. And that's the whole purpose of what miraculous gifts were for. They were basically to last until the scriptures were completed. So nobody can prove that it wasn't until the 400 when they had all of the text circulating. And in fact, I mean, you talk about just the Gospels. The Epistle of Barnabas is dated 70, as early as 70 to the early 2nd century, 110, 120, 130. That had Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, Clement mentions John before the end of the 1st century in 95 through 97 AD. And basically, by the end of middle of 2nd century, by 150, they have all the New Testament books are being referenced. Um, except for maybe third John, I think the earliest reference we had that survived is 170. So like by 170, the Muratorian canon, it's got 22, it's got all four gospels, all of Paul's epistles, all the acts. So, I mean, it's almost kind of like, I, I, I say this, I, I don't mean this mean, but you kind of sound like a biblical, biblical skeptic, like Bart Ehrman. That's the kind of argument he makes. Like you really can't know what they had sort of casting doubt the text. So I would say this. By the end of the first century, it's the uh, scriptures are completed, the New Testament, and you've got guys talking about it within 20, 30 years. So just because we didn't have it compiled until mm -hmm. 400 or the earliest codex. Right. Just, so here's what I would say to that. Uh, don't want to sound like a skeptic. I'm just saying that if we're going to say the gospel is the whole New Testament, that would be really bad because the whole New Testament, like you said, was not compiled until about the 400s. And if you want to look at the Muratorian canon, it was completed in AD 170. It had all the New Testament books, except Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and 3rd John. So if we're, again, if we're going to say, if someone's going to say that the whole New Testament is the gospel of Jesus Christ, I would say, well, that would be horrible for these people who lived past 170 because they didn't have Hebrews as part of the New Testament. James is, 1st and 2nd Peter, 3rd John. So Hebrew, I, Hebrew. I agree. Now, listen, listen, I agree, Aaron, that it was written before then, but it wasn't compiled, people. If the gospel here, here's my question. Like here's here's the question I'm answering. Okay, I'm answering the question or the the statement that some people make that the Bible is the gospel, the like the the tangible Bible, right? Like right here. Yeah, but I mean, so if the... if this is the gospel, right? If that's <clears throat> the gospel, here's the bad news. The bad news is there's a lot of people who didn't have that. And it was a long time before that was compiled together. Now, were there letters circulating? Of course. Of course there were letters circulating, but it wasn't compiled. I think everybody who's listening to this understands what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I don't believe the Bible to be true. Of course, it's the Word of God. Uh, I'm just answering the deal. If it's if the gospel is the Bible, well, that would be bad news for a lot of people for a lot of, a long time because it wasn't compiled all together to know we well, have the Bible today. That's fine. That's fine if we disagree. Uh, but I'd say number one, you cannot. Do you prove. agree? Do you think? Do you think that that they had well, a printing press back then and they were pumping no, out Bibles? But, no, but I mean, I I didn't say that. But what I'm saying is your assertion that nobody had all of the books in one location until the 350s or 400s. Number one, you can't prove it. All you can say is the oldest surviving codexes we have are from 350. Okay, here's what I can prove. Here's what I can prove, Aaron. And then we'll, we'll, we'll move on to something else. Look at this. I can prove this. James was written around 40 to 49 AD. Do you agree with that? What's your point? No, I'm well, trying to... Just, do you agree with that? Do you, that's my point. Do you agree that James was written around 40 to 49 AD? I'm, that's and fine. I'm not... Corinthians... Not well, no, listen. I'm, I'm, I want to make the point because I feel like you are arguing because I'm like, this is a simple point that I'm making, but Corinthians is, it was written around AD 55. Okay. So let's just say James was written around 50 and Corinthians was written around 55. Well, if the whole Bible 
and everything written in the Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ, then that would mean that people who lived those five years in between who didn't have, they only had James and Corinthians was written later, then that gap right there, if the gospel is all the Bible, no, my point is the gospel is the message of Jesus Christ and what he did and what he accomplished. People who say that the gospel is the whole Bible, well, then you can't have the gospel unless you have the whole Bible. That's my point. I understand letters were written. At, I have every date of every letter. I understand that they were circulating. I understand the councils. I understand all that. Took classes on it in seminary. My point, I think you know my point, and I think you're making a bigger deal about it than, than I think anybody listening is. I think they understand what I'm saying. The gospel is not the Bible. If it is the Bible, then you're right. I can't prove that they don't have every single letter, but I can, I can pretty much guarantee you this. The majority of people didn't. Printing press, they didn't have it. So right. I ask you this. That's my only point. I, well, I think, so the other thing I mentioned is, I think it's relevant, is, you know, you say, well, if, if, you know, James is written 40, 49, and Corinthians is written 55, what did they do? Uh, you do, I've mentioned this a few times in our discussions, and I don't feel like you've really caught, you do understand the first century, they had miraculous gifts, right? And you understand that 1 Corinthians 14 talks about what is one of the purposes of miraculous gifts to edify. So 1 Corinthians 13 talks about those miraculous gifts were going to last until what? Until the completed New Testament revelation was completed. So if John, if revelation is not written till 90, um, some people disagree with that day. That's fine. If it's not written till then, that doesn't mean that those people who had those miraculous gifts wouldn't have known that information. Second of all, I think sort of the, your whole argument was j that John was written in 90 and that the people before them didn't have the whole Bible. And the point you're trying to make is that they don't know all about baptism. I mean, I think you'd agree that most people say the earliest gospel was Mark, and Mark ends 1616, with he that believes and is baptized will be saved. So all I'm saying is, number one, the idea that they didn't have certain books till, that doesn't matter when they have miraculous gifts that probably went through the end of the first century, right? Second of all, you know, you're mentioning like, well, the Muratorian canon doesn't have Hebrews. Yeah, but the pseudo Barnabas in the end of the first century has it. So what I'm saying is there's lots of records that show that they had at least every single book in the New Testament. And the other thing too is it's 2000 years later. That's only what we have now. So I have no doubt there were all these things circulating like they would, the early church was doing and they were instructed to do Colossians 4, 16. So, you know, I'm just saying that's what guys like Bart Ehrman say, which is, well, hey, we don't have any record of third John until 150. Therefore, the early, early church didn't have it. That doesn't mean the early church didn't have it. Number one, it just means that no papyri has survived 2,000 years. So that's all I'm saying is I don't want I don't want someone out there watching this discussion to think that you're saying, well, basically, you can't trust which books you have in the Bible because they weren't put together till 400. I just uh, don't think that argument is right. So let's just be clear. You can go back and rewind everything I've said in the last discussion, this one. You're muted. You went quiet. I would say nowhere have I ever said you can't trust it because you don't know when they were written. That has never been my point. That's nothing even remotely close to what I've just said in this episode. Um, I think you're, I don't know, it sounds like you're trying to call some doubt or something over nothing. Um, so, yeah, you can trust every word of the Bible. Um, I'm going to go ahead and punt it and go on to something else and uh, because we're friends. Okay, so let's see here. Now we're going to talk about faith alone. Is that what's up next? That's great. Okay, and I'll go 15 to 20 minutes on faith alone. Then you'll go. Is that right? Then you go. Sure, it doesn't matter whatever order. And then we you have go. 10 minutes of questions or whatever. That's great. All right. So I'll go first. Faith alone. Um, that is the Christian faith. Um, every religion in the world Every religion in the world, I don't care if it's Mormon, I don't care if it's Zeus, you, you worship Zeus, uh, any false religion in the world says that, uh, I mean, I'm going to mute this real case, just so you remind me that I muted you, okay? Uh, so every religion in the world, oh my goodness, let me give me a 15 minute countdown too. Can you hear every me now? I, okay. Yeah, I got Sorry, you. I'm muted myself, so I, you wouldn't hear me typing. Okay, I'm going to mute. Okay, you muted yourself. All right, so every religion in the world says you have to have faith in some false god because it's not the true god, but you have faith in this god that you worship, 
and then you have to prove yourself. You have to do something, okay? That's every religion in the world. Let me say it again. Every false religion in the world says faith plus works, faith plus you proving yourself to the false God that you worship is, is true. That's what they would say, right? But Christianity is the only, only religion in the world that says, no, that's just not the way it works. It's, it's faith. It's faith in our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's faith in him and what he did. That's the good news of the gospel is what it's a declaration of what Christ did. Uh, Paul distinguishes between faith and I mean, baptism in the gospel. We might be able to get that a little later. But faith alone in Christ alone is the Christian faith. Um, so that's what I would say. But here's what I want to do, and here's what we're going to do today. Uh, I want to show you something here real quick. This is what I want to do. Okay, so the Bible is clear in 2 Timothy 2.14 to um, remind them of these things, charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Here's why I'm going to do that. I get, obviously, if you can believe it or not, I get a lot of calls from some people in some groups that uh, want to discuss with me or, or debate with me. I'm not big on debates. I'm not, not that organized, and I'm too busy. But... They want to do that, and I, and I have many emails to them. I'm like, look, that, that's fine. We'll do it, but can you can you define some terms, right? And the crazy thing is they don't like to define terms because if they do, their whole system collapses. But I want to show you this right here, why that is. Because if you look at this verse, like I have a definition for the word faith. I have a definition for the word baptism. I have a definition for justification. I have definitions for the words that are used in the Bible, Okay. Now, if I'm talking to someone who uses the same words as me, which is what we call talking Christianese, they use the same words. They, they say faith. Yeah, you're, you're saved by faith. But they don't have the same definition, right? Uh, then what it does is when you're listening to this conversation of me and say, Aaron, you hear me say faith. You hear him say faith. You hear us say in these words. But what you don't know is we're using two different definitions, two different understandings of this word. And what does it do? doesn't hurt Aaron. Aaron knows what, he's, what his meaning. I know my meaning. But the people out there who are listening, you, it hurts you because it, 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 you get confused. You're like, what, what are they even saying? Because they're saying the same thing, but they're not saying the same thing. And it's because we're using two different definitions. This is why it matters on what words mean. But here it is right here in the scriptures. It says this right here. Remind them of these things. Charge them before God, not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Okay? Rightly handling the word of truth. Well, don't quarrel about these things. Well, I'm not going to quarrel about it. I'm not going to quarrel about the words. But if you start twisting God's word, we're going to quarrel. I'm going to defend the faith. I'm going to be a buttress of truth. I'm going to stand there, and I'm not going to budge. And I'm going to show you that that, that you're, you're, you're twisting God's word to fit your own theology. And so here's some things I want to talk about when it comes to faith alone. This is why, because Aaron will probably remember saying this right here in our discussions. He said this right here. How do you define a Greek word? You define a Greek word by looking at a Greek lexicon, which are like Greek dictionaries. Here's another time he says this right here. There are lots of guys who make bad arguments from English to support their theological bias. That is so true. And I'm saying you don't uh, make the argument from English. You look at what the word means in Greek according to a lexicon, and you go from there. And we, me and you, speaking to me, right, have talked about BDAG as a great one. So BDAG is a great one, according to Aaron. That's what we should go by. So if we want to understand what a word means in the, in the Bible, we need to go to a Greek lexicon, see what the definition is, go from there, understand what they meant by it, here, you look at what the word means in Greek according to a lexicon, and you go from there. So, and just for the people who are watching, maybe you hadn't watched the other, um, I, I look at them as conversations, maybe you say them as a debate, but I want to show you that I didn't just make those up. I'm going to just show you a few clips here of Aaron saying these things. So here we go. So, you know, many different exegetical books and hermeneutics books, which are the fancy words for what's the text say and how do you interpret it? They say, how do you define an English word? or uh, sorry, a Greek word. Uh, you define a Greek word by looking at Greek lexicons, which are like Greek dictionaries. And they take into account what the word meant, not only in biblical Greek, but also the Greek surrounding at the time. So BDAG is one that I know Trey and I and a lot of guys that, that I know and talk to all agree is a great lexicon, right? So BDAG. Uh 
And so there you have them about BDAG is a great one. That's what you need to go to. If you want to understand what words mean in the Bible, go to BDAG. Here's one right here. Yeah. So not to get into, well, let me say this quickly. You already know this, but the grammatical historic, uh, historical method um, of interpretation basically talks about grammatically. You take a look at what the words meant at the time it was written in that culture, right? So what did, you know, the word, I'm trying to think of a, a word, it doesn't matter. What did that word mean in the Greek uh, at the time that it was written? Right. That's what lexicon. That's why we look to a Greek lexicon for a definition, not, you know, Miriam Webster, a modern definition. And then his. All right, and here's one more. What I'm saying is that there are lots of guys who make bad arguments from English to support their theological bias. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying you don't make the argument from English. You look at what the word means in Greek, according to a lexicon, and you go from there. And we've me and you have talked about BDAG's a great. One. Yeah. So this is the truth is when it comes to. You know, I forget who the theologian was, but it says when it comes to cults, the definitions are always where the battle is. The battle is with the definition of words. And so here, I just want to look at this quote again. There are lots of guys who make bad arguments from English to support their theological bias. 100% agree. 100% agree with that. Um, and he says, I'm saying you don't make the argument from English. You look at what the word means in Greek, according to a lexicon, and you go from there. And we, me and you, Trey, have talked about being like, as a great one. You just heard him say it. There's the quote. I'm, I'm willing to bet that, that one of us doesn't really mean that. We, we're going to say that. We have to say that. And I think what happens is a lot of times, especially in the Church of Christ, that, and it's not, it's not said, it's just, it's unsaid, but it's, it, you get it. You know it. You don't question your leaders, right? You just, you, you believe what they say, and you don't question them. Um, but for a lot of people who've reached out to me, I'm going to say, like, yes, I will continue asking those hard questions that you want. Uh, but anyway, so that's what I'm saying. Faith alone, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. I mean, it's, this is the Christian uh, doctrine, Romans 3. Let's go down here. I want to show you here that we're justified by faith, right, apart from works. Here it is right here. You see this right here? For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So you can put anything in this section right here. You can put we are justified by faith apart from eating bananas, apart from jumping rope, apart from anything. The point is we are justified by faith, right? Like my good friend, the apologetic dog said um, one time, he said, so look, if, if you said Jesus Christ is the son of God, he's not the son of Baal. Well, that statement, Jesus Christ is the son of God. He's not the son of Baal, right? Well, could someone say, well, but he's possibly the son of Ra, or he's possibly the son of some other God? No, because the point is he's the son of God. He is the son of God, and we are justified by faith, apart from works of the law, right? And so it's just the Christian faith. Every other religion in the world says faith plus something else equals salvation to the God that you worship. That is not the Christian God. That is the Galatian heresy. I think we're going to talk about Galatians at the end. And that's really all the time I need on that. I'll let you go ahead and go. And you got your questions probably ready for, um, for me. But you want to go first and then we'll do questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll do my opening statement and then we can. Okay, I'll give you a few minutes. Yeah, back and forth. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So um, I meant to mention this earlier. We just filmed the whole reason Trey and I basically started was because of the cultish episode. <clears throat> he was a guest on the cultish show. I reached out to those guys, Jeremiah and Andrew, talked to them and reached out to Trey. So we filmed six hours of answering the air, uh, six one hour episodes going through their whole two hour cultish episode that Trey was a, a guest on. And we've released two of those so far. You can see those on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. All right. Are we saved by faith alone? All right. Faith has many definitions. I'm glad Trey. They made my quotes look pretty cool. That, that was cool. But um, the opening argument is, what are we talking about when we talk about faith? My opening argument is the definitions. So I actually, straight from BDAG, what does the word faith mean? Now, faith is the pistis, pistis, however you want to say it, is the noun form. Believes, pistuo is the verb form. Uh, if you look at BDAG, number one, there's three definitions. Number one, the personal belief about God and Jesus. Uh, number two, personal belief about a matter of opinion. Romans 14, 22 and 23 says, if, if you have that faith, keep it to yourself. It's not talking about your belief about the gospel. It's talking about a personal opinion you have. And then number three, the system of faith that Jesus established. Um, Galatians 1.23, Paul preached the faith that he once tried to destroy. Jude 3, uh, contend for the faith once delivered for all. All right. So uh, we're talking about the first definition today. 
is a person saved by personal belief alone, a personal belief about God and Jesus, okay? If we were talking about the third definition, Aaron, do you believe a person is saved by the system of faith alone, the, the gospel? I'd say yes, but that's not what we're discussing. We're discussing is one saved by their personal belief in Jesus before doing anything else? And I would state confidently, clearly, and hopefully humbly that no, you're not. Uh, you might say, Aaron, but don't you know the majority of the U.S. religious people in the United States and in the world say we're saved by belief alone? Yeah, I know that, but God's the majority, not the teachings of man. Romans 3, 4 says, let God be true and every man a liar. You might say, Aaron, you know that the last 500 years of religious history since the Protestant Reformation taught sola fide, faith alone, personal belief alone. That's the majority belief. Well, sure, in Protestant churches, but God's the majority. And I don't agree with something just because it's been the majority for the last 500 years. In fact, the Roman Catholic faith historically seemed to be the majority from the 300s to the 1500s. Would I say that that makes it correct? Of course not. Majority is never the standard of right and wrong. What I'm saying is don't follow the majority, follow the scriptures. John 12, 48 says that that's what's going to judge us on the last day. Uh, will the majority be saved? No. Matthew 7, 13 and 14 says the majority will not be saved. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, broad is the way that leads to destru destruction. There are many who go in by it. Narrow is the gate. Difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Exodus 23, 2. Don't follow a multitude or a crowd to do evil. Romans 3, 4. Let God be true in every man. A liar. The majority will not be saved. And the majority is not the standard of truth. God's word is. If you have an open heart, I hope today that you will see that what the Bible teaches is that we are not saved by personal or uh, belief, personal faith alone. We are saved by personal faith. You have to have personal faith. But if that's all you have and it never goes any further, then you're not saved. And I'll show examples for that. The Bible teaches you must believe in Jesus Christ. He's the son of God, God in the flesh to be saved from your sins. John 3, 16 says that. John 8, 24 says that. Acts 4, 12. John 14, 6. In fact, John chapter 10 and verse 7, I love this passage. Jesus said to them again, most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And then in verse 9, he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. But earlier at the beginning of that chapter, listen to this. This is John 10, 1, verses 1 and 2. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus says, you have to come to me the way that Jesus gives you to come to him. And in fact, if you try to change that, if you try to basically say, well, Jesus said this, but I'm going to ignore some of it. Jesus says, you're actually a thief and a robber trying to climb into the sheepfold another way. And so while the Bible does teach that we're saved by belief, it's necessary, it's mandatory. The Bible does not teach we're saved by personal belief alone. Now, this is an important but. The Bible does not teach salvation by belief alone. The Bible teaches that a person must move on to repent, confess, and that person must be baptized. And that person is not saved before repenting, confessing, and being baptized. Faith is always an action word. The faith that saves is the faith that is obedient. James 2.17 says faith or personal belief alone is dead and cannot save. How can I show that with Bible examples? Mark 2, 1 through 5, you have a paralytic in Capernaum. He and his friends, believes, uh, their beliefs motivate them to reach Jesus. They can't get in. They go on the roof. They dig through the roof. I imagine Jesus dust falling down. I have to think they were really wanted to get to him. I'd be afraid to interrupt Jesus. But yet Jesus says it saw their faith. Some people say, well, it says saw the friend's faith. No, it says saw their faith. That would include the person that was being lowered down on the bed. I doubt he was kicking and screaming, trying to get off the bed. He was obviously involved in it. Saw their faith, including his. And that personal belief only saved him from his uh, par uh, paralysis situation when they were moved to action. Now, Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 13 and 14 says that one must call on the name of the Lord to be saved. If you've watched our first three descriptions, uh, our discussions, Trey denied that. Trey in the first discussion said you're saved at the point in time which you call the name of the Lord, your sins are forgiven. In the second discussion, he changed his position and said you're saved when you believe before you call on the name of the Lord. And in my third discussion video on GBN's YouTube page, I actually edited in the video clips where you can see Trey going back and forth so you can see it for yourself. So you can see from just this passage alone, Romans 10, 13, and 14, salvation does not occur at the point of personal belief alone. Now, let's look at some other scriptural examples where it says people believed, but it doesn't say they were saved. The first one that I'm going to give at least three that Trey really needs to deal with to prove his point. Number one, the scriptures speak of people who believe like John 1, 12, and it says they have the right to become children of God. John 1, 12 says this, as many as received him, to, to them he gave the right to become children of God, 
to those who believe in his name. Notice, it doesn't say that when they believed, they became children of God. This is an analogy. I don't like to argue from analogy, but people who move to Mississippi, which is where I moved to recently, have the right to become residents of Mississippi. I wasn't automatically a resident of Mississippi. I didn't automatically get a driver's license. I had to do certain things. I had the right to get a driver's license when I moved to Mississippi. I didn't move to Mississippi and automatically have the driver's license. I had the right to get a driver's license. A person who goes to a school has the right to become a graduate. They aren't a graduate automatically. And John 1.12 says what? that who as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. John chapter eight, verses 31 and 32 is the next section where it says that they believed in Jesus. John eight thirty one. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, if you abide in my word, you're my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. <clears throat> but the Bible says they believed. Did they believe or not? The Bible says they believed, but they didn't obey. And if you keep following the text, they were rebellious. In John chapter 8, verse 33, they said, we're Abraham's descendants. We've never been slaves to anybody. But remember the book of Judges and the Exodus, the Babylonian captivity, or your current status as Roman subjects. Obviously, they were in slavery. And Jesus tells them, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. He says, not everyone that is born is a slave to sin, like total depravity. Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. And they go back and forth arguing with Jesus. And look at John 8, 59. They took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple and going through the midst of them and so passed by. So the Bible says these people believed in John 8, 31, and yet they try to kill Jesus. My question is, were they saved when they believed? Were these completely regenerated people, as Reformed theology teaches? In fact, I'm kind of surprised. This is our fourth discussion, and I don't think Trey has ever taught what Reformed theology actually teaches, which is regeneration precedes faith. Trey's been saying for three, well, nine, to nine hours so far that when you believe, you're saved. Reformed theology actually teaches you're saved first, and then it allows you to believe. So... I would say this, look at John chapter 12 and verse 42. This is one we're going to talk about in the questions and answers. In John chapter 12 and verse 42, it says this, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So John 12, 42 says what? They believed, but they wouldn't confess. Now, is John inspired or not? Did these people believe yes or no? Trey, in our other discussions, uh, basically it said Ananias wasn't inspired, and then he was, but he, he admitted finally that he, Ananias was inspired. And I know that he believes John is inspired. So John says these people believed. Now, if regeneration precedes faith, as Reformed theology teaches, then these people were saved. Because Reformed theology, Calvinism, says you can't believe until you're already regenerated. So how did these people in John chapter 12 and verse 42 believe if they were totally depraved, unregenerate people? Uh, in fact, earlier in our discussion, Trey said these people in John 12, 42 had a seed of belief. I'm going to ask him in the questions. This is, maybe I should wait, but I'll just let him know. What does it mean to have a seed of belief that people were believed? Were they half regenerate? Is that is Reformed theology teaching now? I know they're not. That somebody is unregenerate and then they get regenerated a little bit and now they're, they have seeds of belief and they're half regenerated? That's a question I want Trey to address. The, the people that say you, you're saved at belief alone need to answer at least these three verses. I could have given many more, but I wanted for time's sake to keep it short. John 1, 12, those who believed as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God. They believed they weren't children of God yet. John 8, 31, people who believed in Jesus, the Bible says they believed, they tried to stone Jesus. And John 12, 42, these people believed, but they wouldn't confess. <clears throat> here's, my, um, here's my expectation of what's going to happen. Uh, listen for it, because this is what I'm predicting is going to happen. Uh, Trey is proud to be reformed. He said he's been proud to be called a Calvinist. Um, and the Calvinist doctrine teaches you're saved before you believe. They say regeneration precedes faith. So I think that puts a massive problem here with verses that the Bible says a person believed. The, the people that believe tried to kill Jesus. They won't confess Jesus. And so what they're going to say is, well, in John 8, 31, it says they believed, but they really didn't believe. Well, why, why would he have to do that? Why would the Bible say they believed in John uh, 12, 42 and in John 8, 31? But Reformed theology has to say, well, they really didn't believe though. Well, it's because Calvinistic doctrine says everybody's born hating God. Uh, they call them vipers and diapers. R.C. Sproul said comparing a baby to a rat was insulting to the rat. And why is that important in this current discussion? Because Reformed theology says you can't believe unless you're already saved. That would mean every person who believes is already saved. But that's not what John 1, 12 says. That's not what John 8, 31 says. That's not what John chapter 12 and verse 42 says. So either these people believed and they were saved, and Reformed theology is right, or these people in John 12, 42 who believed um, were not saved yet, 
because salvation does not come at belief uh, alone. Now, I would say this. <clears throat> if there are so many verses that say, believe and you'll be saved, then what do you do with other verses uh, that say, for instance, Acts eleven eighteen, 18, they were granted repentance unto life, repent, repentance leading to spiritual life. In Romans 10, 9 and 10, belief and confession are necessary. And for instance, the first three discussions, Acts 22, 16, Paul, the person who wrote all those Pauline epistles, the person who said in Ephesians and Romans, you all were saved just like I was, Paul's sins were not forgiven at belief. They were not forgiven at repentance. They weren't forgiven until he in Acts 22, 16 was told to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. <clears throat> Trey's a sharp guy. I got to give him that. Um, he's good. I, I would say he's respectfully good at deflecting and playing word games, but I don't really think it's Trey's fault. I just think that the doctrine can't be defended. Uh, Trey didn't come up with it. Um, I would hold that Augustine did in the late, early 300s, 400s, uh, late 300s, early 400s. Um, I think he was good with words too. He got everybody to start believing what he taught was orthodoxy when it wasn't. Nobody before him taught that. When Trey says, well, Calvinism is the historic faith. No, it isn't. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I've, I've done, I did one video already on my personal YouTube going through the first and second century, just giving quote after quote from these early writers, early Christians who taught the opposite. But once again, that's church history. Those guys weren't, uh, those were guys weren't inspired. So if you attend a church that's reformed and you think, well, my, my church doesn't think that our children are vipers and diapers. Yeah, they do. Uh, I know that Trey would affirm that. And I know that Jeremiah and all the other guys who are truly reformed would say, no, babies are there. They are wicked. They're God haters. And I would also say that if you go to Calvinistic church, that's what they believe. And if you don't just ask your leaders, you might be surprised. So I say all that with a minute and 54 left to say this. Trey's a sharp guy. It's not that Trey isn't smart. Trey's very intelligent. Uh, I just don't think that you can answer the arguments because the doctrinal system is flawed. Uh, God's truth always exposes error the more you test it. God's word is the anvil. Truth is the anvil. And truth will wear out false doctrine the more you examine it. And so I'd love to hear in our cross-examination, Trey explain John 1.12, uh, explain John 8.31, and explain John 12.42. Tell me why these people believe. The Bible says they believed. Tell me how, as soon as you believe, you're saved according to your doctrine. And yet these people believed and they weren't saved. Um, you don't need to show me passages that say you have to believe. I teach that. I just taught John 8, 24, John 3, 16. But what I'm saying is you really have to deal with the other passages that say <clears throat> someone like Paul is not saved until when? He's already believes, but he's not saved, right? You have to deal with the passages that say more. That's the only way really to examine uh, the belief alone doctrine. So I'll leave uh, 50 seconds up. I'll wrap it up there and let Trey go and I'll pop a cough drop in so I don't lose my voice. All right. That was good. You're fired up. You're fired up today, dude. It's been a while since we got together. You took off a month. You had to make all those videos about me. Huh? I appreciate you saying I'm smart. I don't get that much. Um, I thought I was muted. I did make a few. Um, I might make I might make a few myself. But uh, all right. So now cross examine you. Me. I'll I'll cross examine you, or you want to cross examine me first. You do me first, since I went first, and then I'll. I'll answer your, what y'all you said there. I took a few notes. Yeah. I mean, uh, I don't have, I don't have a lot from your statement. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like you talked a little bit about arguing about definitions. I mean, I already intended to talk about the three definitions of at least faith from BDAG right there in mind. So I'm not, I don't have an issue with definitions. Um, <clears throat> you know, you guys said that in the cultish video about Christianese, how we speak it was in the cultish episode. Interestingly, at the beginning, you said we were dangerous because we're, uh, you said that we, you said we were so dangerous at like 31 minutes because we don't have other books like Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, but we just speak Christianese. I mean, I would think that's a good thing that our discussions are centered around the Bible and not the Book of Mormon, that sort of thing. Um, I'd say really the only thing that, that you say, I mean, there's not really much in there that I feel like needs responding to, except for you basically said that Christianity, historic Christianity um, is historic Christianity is the, is the Christianity that says it's faith in what Jesus did. And that's it. I and mean, first of all, it's just not true. I mean, I've showed you earlier Christian, uh, Christian writers who basically said that basically for the first 300 years, baptism is the point in which you contact the blood of Christ and your sins are forgiven. You said every false religion says you have to prove yourself and do something. I mean, Christianity, um, that's what the whole debate's been about. Does the Bible say that? Yes or no. Mark 16, 16, you said, you said every false religion says you have to do something. Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. I mean, believing is something you have to do. Um, Matthew 7, 21 on judgment day. What's the reason those people are turned away? <clears throat> 
Jesus said, uh, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. You say, well, no, every false religion says you have to do something. And the Bible says, he who does the will of my father in heaven. Um, verse 24. I think, I think here's what I think you're, <coughs> you're forgetting. We're, I'm talking about when is one justified before God? When is one deemed righteous in the eyes of God in the courts of heaven? When, when are you deemed righteous, acquitted of all of your sins and transgressions? It's my faith not faith plus doing something. Does people who have faith do things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we feed the hungry. This is what, this is the difference between uh, um, a Christian and a religious person. A religious person feeds the hungry and clothes the poor, goes to church, sings songs, prays, all that stuff, so he will be saved. The Christian does the same exact things, but he's doing it because he is saved. So true faith produces good works and obedience, but obedience and good works does not produce saving faith. That's the difference. That's why it's dangerous because it's they look just alike. But um, yeah, I'm talking about justification. I'm not. I'm not talking. And I think you know that. But when you say it, this is what hurts the hearers. They're thinking that people who say we're justified by faith, apart from works of any kind, they're taking what you're saying to say that we believe that we don't have to do what God said to do. No, we do it because of what He's done for us. Like, yes, we do all those things. So I'm not saying that you don't do anything. No, Christians, man, they we do it all. And uh, But it's the point of justification. When are you justified in the courts of heaven? Is it by faith or by faith plus, in your case, baptism? So I just want to clear that up. Sure. And that's, I mean, I guess that's kind of in my statement. I hope you'll respond to it. You know, you just said once again, I know it's your position. You're justified by faith. That's belief, right? So... My response is, well, number one, Paul wasn't, and neither were all these other people that I just brought up. But we're not—we don't have to go back on the Paul situation. We already spent nine. We hours can a little bit, but well, let me, uh, let me address a few. Years. And then, yeah, John one twelve, John eight, yeah, uh, yeah John yeah. eight, and John twelve. And so John I want to first address how you said, well, it's not the historic faith; it's only five hundred years old since the Reformation. Um, I broke down what you said about. Um, uh, Justin Martyr um, showed you tons of texts of Justin Martyr, what he said. But I just want to show you some things that happened a lot way before the Reformation. Here is Justin Martyr right here. He says, but by faith through which from the beginning Almighty God has justified all men by faith. Right? Here, I mean, I can go through hundreds of these. Justified by faith. That's Irenaeus. That's way early. That's like hundreds. Uh, yeah, but, justified by faith. But you, you just go those texts looking for what you want to find. I teach you justified by faith. The well, difference is those yeah, guys also. Exactly. We, we change, you, you're changing the definition and we're going to go by that. But I, I'm just showing you all through here. I mean, I can go through this so much. Believing in the name of the Lord Jesus, receive the Holy Spirit by believing. You don't believe that, right? You believe, well, you would say, yeah, believing, but that also means baptism. But we know the word believing does not mean baptism. Um, but this is the, the issue here uh, that is those who are justified by faith. I mean, that's Irenaeus, you know. Um, I can just go through a whole lot of these. The cross, the believing on him shall live forever. The ones believing on him, that's Justin Martyr. Now, you would say, but believing means baptism. No one in the world, no, no I, dictionary, nothing says that believing is baptism. So uh, that if they repent, all who wish for it obtain mercy from God. And the scriptures foretells that they shall be blessed, saying, blessed is the man to whom the Lord imputes no sin as having repented of his sins, that he may receive remission from those sins. You don't, Justin Martyr. You don't, you don't believe that, though. You said you no. don't have to repent in multiple discussions. So that, that doesn't help you. So who is he writing to? See, this is the, the thing. This is with Trifo right here. The thing is, context always matters, okay? Because when you proof text your way through the Bible, and I think this is what we're going to start seeing the deeper we go into the deeper doctrines, uh, you're going to see that your proof text will get you in really a pickle and you start contradicting the Bible, even though you have to say the Bible doesn't contradict. Now, Christians don't believe the Bible contradicts, but when you proof text your way through it, you're going to contradict yourself everywhere. So do you, um, do you want so to go ahead? answer your questions? Yeah, so that was all I had really to say from your opening statement. I don't yeah. feel like so covered here's, much internally, but so. So I'll, yeah. I'll answer your, I'll, I'll give you my take on what you said. First of all, you said we're saved by personal faith, but you have to have more than that. Is that true? I mean, that's what you said. That's what I wrote down. So you're yeah. saved by personal faith, but you have to have more than that. 
Okay. Repentance, confession, and baptism. Let me say this again. Here's what you said. You're saved by personal faith, but you have to have more than that. Is that an accurate statement? Correct. That's okay. correct. So let me let me ask you again. So you're saved by personal faith, but you have to have more than that. So are, am I saved by faith once I have faith, or am I not justified by faith when I have faith? Okay. Because you said, I am saved by faith, personal faith, but you have to have more than that. So I guess I'm really not saved when I have personal faith. It's personal faith plus the more than that, whatever that is. Is that accurate statement? Is that your understanding? So I'll let you respond to John 1, 12, John 8 and John 12 after, but I will respond to that. Personal faith is necessary, but you are not saved. You are not justified as soon as you have personal belief or else. That's why I asked you that three times. So you don't believe that we're saved by personal faith, but you have to have more than that. You don't really believe that you're saved by personal faith. You're the king of word games, man. You, you don't <laughs> let me say it. Yeah. What I'm saying is, do you have to have per- John 8, 24, unless you believe that I'm healed on your sins. It is necessary to believe in Jesus. Mark mm-hmm. 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized. Yes, mm-hmm. if you have personal faith, that is necessary. But that's not the point in which you're justified, because I'd love to hear you explain to me how John 12, 42, they believe, but you're going to say they weren't saved. Okay. Uh, John 8, you, they believed, you're going to say they weren't saved. John 1, 12, it says mm-hmm. the people who believe were given the right to become something. How about James 2, the demons believe? Exactly. You forgot, to, you forgot to use that one on me. The demons you know, believe. I'm not wrong with that one, because they're not obedient. The demons, right, the demons are, believe. They stop there. But according to your understanding, according to your, your understanding of my understanding, I must say that demons are saved. That would be your doctrine. You the according one that to your it. understanding of my the understanding. Of faith. Right. So again, when you said we are saved by personal faith, but you have to have more than that, you agreed with that statement three times. But now you're saying, yeah, that I don't mean that you're saved by personal faith. I just means you, you've you've reached one of the steps of personal faith, of salvation. You have to do that and then these other things, right? I clarified it, so I'm not going to I'm not going to repeat it again. Yeah, I think it was I, pretty clear. Thank I you would for like, clarifying that. So it's not like, so you don't correct. agree that we're saved by personal faith. That's just the you have to have that and then the other steps. Okay. So John 1 Let me go over here just to answer your your questions. John 1, 12. All right. So, the true light, which gives light. I'm going to start verse 9. Gives light to everyone who's coming to the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay? So, those who believed in him, he gave the right to become children of God. He gave them the right, right? He gave them the right because they didn't deserve it, right? Because we're saved by grace, right? Do you agree with that? That they believed, so he gave them the right. And they were born. Look at this. They were born. Well, they were already born once because they're believing in God, right? Obviously, they're alive, but they were born or born again. But look at this. They were born not of blood, so it wasn't their mom and daddies. And that's why they believed because their mom and daddies, that's not why nor the will of the flesh, nor hard work. Hard work didn't do it. Nor of the will of man. Wow. Not even your own free will did it. But of God. They were reborn of God. God gave them new life. Right? And guess what new life does when God raises a dead man to life? They look back to him in faith and they say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your grace and mercy. You did it. So, yeah, that's what I would say. That that's what we're talking about there. These people were reborn, and he goes on to talk about that when you get to chapter three. That's not what John refers. Was about, John, John one. Anyway, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I'll let you. John one twelve. I just. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born. Now I'm in thirteen. Is it okay if I read the verse below it? No, so no, they were born of God. It had nothing to do with their will, their family line, or their own free will, their own hard work. But God, God brought them back to life. That's what he does. He's in the business of bringing people back to life. Now, you want to look at uh, John so 10. Your, so your explanation of John 1, 12, where the verse says, as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. You would say what that actually means is to those who believed in him, they were already children of God. No, here's what I'll tell you. Is that not what Here, reformed let me, the you, let me give you the, no, regeneration precedes faith okay let me be clear about that 
uh, this is John giving his gospel account, right? And he says that these people were believed because they were born again. Why were they born again? Well, it wasn't their hard work. It wasn't their bloodline. It wasn't their will of the flesh. That's hard work. It wasn't the will of man. And we can look at di different translations. But of God. That's why they were born again. God did a miracle in their heart. He basically, when he gets to Nicodemus in chapter 3, he took out the heart of stone, gave a heart of flesh. He put the spirit within caused them to obey him and to follow his rules. That's what he's talking about here. So, yes, pre regeneration precedes that. So here's 1 John 5. Uh, look at this right here. Everyone, everyone who believes that Jesus the Christ has been born of God. So let's read that again. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ, not will be, not can be, but has been born of God. That's what regeneration, because God brings people to life, and we were spiritually dead. We were spiritually blinded. Therefore, so we needed a miracle. Ephesians 2 really hits that hard. But I want to go to your John 10. John 8. John 8. 8 31. John, John 8, 30. Okay, first, I want, to, I want to hit the, yeah, you said the paralytic, right? Uh, what account is that, Matthew? What? Well, that's the paralytic. And they brought the friends down, the friends, and he said, "Your your your faith is saved." You You want to deal with that one? Well, I mean, I just want to point Mark, one thing out: the paralytic. You said Mark what? Mark two. Mark two. All right. And when they could not get near him because the crowd, they removed the roof above him. They that they that removed the roof. It wasn't the paralytic, right? And when they had made an opening, guess who didn't make opening? The paralytic. They let down the bed in which the paralytic laid. I, I know that he didn't do anything because he's paralyzed, right? Well, that, that, I mean, you could be paralyzed from the waist down. There's different. There's different levels of paralysis. Okay, so maybe he was using his arms. Okay, I think the point that God's making here. See, I saw your. I saw their faith, and he said to the paralytic, "Son, your sins are forgiven." He said to who? The paralytic. Why? He said, "Your sins are forgiven." Why? Because he saw their faith. Faith is not actions. Faith is not work. Faith is something inside. It's trust. We'll get into that in a minute. When we look at the word in the lexicons like you said we should do. But he saw their faith, and their faith saves them because that's what the Christian religion teaches, is that you're saved by faith. This paralytic did nothing. Um, so, John, you said 8, you want to go to? John eight thirty one. These people, the Jews who believed in Jesus and then tried to stone mm -hmm. him you to know i want to know if those people are saved if they're regenerated or not the ones that try no, to kill i don't Jesus. think they're regenerated right here no here's one it, so the so. jesus said to the jews who had believed right and so i think we just got to get a lot of context here right? where he's preaching to them he goes on to say to a lot of these people that you're sons of the devil you know a lot of people you probably think that everybody's a child of god but according to jesus some people are sons of the devil and the will of them is to do their father's will. You know what the father's will, his, their father's will is? Murder, lie. They, he hates the truth. Uh, but the people of God hears the words of God right here. Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. Okay? So we'll get to that when we get into election and things like that. I don't want to water that down yet. But uh, where are we at here? Verse 20, 31. 31. So, so Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, who had believed him, right? Maybe the things concerning he said up here, right? I don't think they had personal trust and faith and confidence in Christ. They believed some things that he was saying. They believed that what, who he might have been. They might even believe that he was the Christ. Maybe, possibly, but let me tell you something. Just intellectual knowledge doesn't save anyone. You can have, you know what? The devil himself has the whole Bible memorized. You can have all the knowledge of Jesus. You can memorize every verse. Jesus is in the desert, and Satan is quoting Scripture to him. Satan's not a Christian. Does he believe God exists? Yeah, he knows for a fact he does, right? But he doesn't trust. He doesn't have his heart changed towards him. So you can have intellectual head knowledge, just like the demons in chapter 2. You can have intellectual head knowledge, but that's not what it's talking about. Um, so they're believing some things about Jesus. Okay. John 10, so you, and I'll, I'll show you this right here. Um, John say, 10. John. Uh, oh, I think, uh, but before you move John 8, or 12, just to clarify, you said 
you said these people were totally unregenerate and yet they could still believe in Jesus as a Christ and not be saved? You can believe some facts about Jesus. You can say, I think Jesus, I think Satan knows that he is the son of God. He knows that he's the Messiah, but he's not saved because intellectual knowledge doesn't get you anywhere. That's not true faith. That's not the faith in the context we're talking about, right? So again, we weren't context matters. No. Yeah, but mm-hmm. we're, John 8, 31, it says they believed in Jesus and you're saying they weren't saved. So you say as soon as you believe, but so now you're, I guess, qualifying and saying, well, basically the only, I mean, I just feel like it's circular reasoning. You're saying the text says they believe, but the only reason that I know okay, it wasn't real. Then, then do this for me, Aaron. Aaron, do this for me. What does this mean? Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God, not will be. First of all, you want to look at, the, you got your Greek text there. Tenses, mm-hmm. whoever believes, that's that's present tense, whoever keeps on believing. Right. So say those people in John 8, they believed, but it's I believe that's errors. So they didn't keep on believing. They had belief in one thing, but that belief didn't move them to change their life. And so they weren't well, whoever saved. Whoever believes, right, has been born of God. Present right? tense, that is born of God's perfect tense. Okay. So I'm saying that these people did not have a trust in Jesus Christ. They didn't trust that he was the Savior, his Savior. They didn't want to trust him. It's just the same thing in John, was it 12? John 12? Yeah. I just think what you're doing is, you know, First John 5, 1, whoever believes Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And you just said in John 8, has 31. Been, not is, but has been born of God. Well, that's one interpretation. It's perfect tense. I'm looking at the New King James. The translators translate a little bit differently, but I don't know that I think that's wrong. Um, I don't know if there's a textual variant there or not. Okay, so here we go. So I guess what I'm saying is like, you bring up First John 5, 1, whoever believes is born of God or has been born of God. But yet, John 8, 31, they believe, and you're saying those people aren't born of God. So I just think that it's circular reasoning because you look at somebody, and if they have belief, but they're not. it's not like this belief that changes their entire life. You say, oh, well, that's not real belief. But the text doesn't say that. The text says they believed. But you say, yeah, but it wasn't real belief. No, because true belief and trust in Jesus Christ is something that God does. It's a miracle. He changes your heart. He that's puts your his spirit in you. No, that's the scripture. That's it's simple circular scripture. Reason. It's circular so reason. Context will always rule, right? So we can see that these people don't truly believe in that sense, just like demons believe. But guess what? Do you think I believe that demons are going to heaven? Or you just think I'm really inconsistent? That's what you're saying? I think you're inconsistent. Yeah. Okay. Because you basically, you, you know, you could make the argument, well, demons are different. Satan's different. All right. Well, John 8 31, I showed you people, humans. It says they believed. And the Bible says if you believe, you're saved according to your doctrine. But you say, but these people, because their actions, I know they weren't saved. Or okay. your doctrine is wrong. And belief has to motivate you to a change of life with repentance, confession, and baptism. And that's when you become saved. No, I believe that God changes your heart and me calling on his name, repenting, all those things are fruit of a changed heart and belief in Jesus Christ, trust in him because he saved you. Yeah. We'll get on to that. So you're just going to have to agree to disagree or I'm going to agree to disagree with you. Sure. I think the context is these people believe, like, where is it in John? Is it John 10 where it says they, uh, some of them believed, but um, didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue? I think it's 12, though. 42, that's the next one I brought up. Is that where? John 12, 42. That's the next 42. one I brought up. Right. So let's look here. John 12, 42. So nevertheless, many, even the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Okay? This happens a lot in, in religious circles. Um, I'll just say the Church of Christ. That they, They're like, man, I know this is wrong, but... Guess what? If I say this, if I do this, if I come out and say this, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose my friends, family, everything. I might lose my title. This is what, because they, they love the glory of men than God himself. But thank God there are people out there, like the one I had called me last Wednesday, Church of Christ preacher, came back, preached doctrines of grace, faith alone, the baptism didn't save him. Monday, he got a call from elders that his services are not needed anymore at this church. Because that's what's gonna it's gonna cost you, right? So here's well, what I would say to this. Well, I want to answer this real quick. Here's what I would say. See, here in Acts, though, this is amazing. But later on, we see this: the word continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests who became obedient to the faith. I pray that these people right here in John 
10, uh, 12, those were those who later finally did come to faith and, and step out and take the persecution, lose the relationships, lose the title, lose the attaboys, because they finally come to truly trust in everything of Christ, and they step out in true faith. That might be a good transition, because that actually is one of the questions I had for you. Um, is that okay if we transition into the questions? Well, let's, uh, before we do that, what do we have here? You want to do the questions now? Rebuttal. So yeah, we did the rebuttal. So yeah, questions, 30 minutes. Yeah. You, you want to go first? Yeah. Like I'll ask a question then you can ask me one, then I'll ask you one back. Um, so, okay. So here's the question. So John 12 42, since we're already there in the text, this is great. So in our last discussion, um, we were talking about John 12, 42, and you brought it up. Uh, and you basically said that these people who believed, you said um, they didn't have a saving faith, but maybe they had a seed of belief. Um, this is what you said. It is true that these. this is a one hour, 21 minutes and 49 second. That's the timestamp. You said it is true that these people believed and they're not Christians. Yeah. You know why? Because they didn't truly believe and trust in their heart. But maybe there was a seed of belief in them but they didn't believe where they were willing to risk everything. And so then again, at one hour and 23 minutes and nine seconds, you said, yeah, they had a seed of belief in them. Uh, and then you said the same thing. Well, maybe in Acts 6, these are those people who were obedient. So my question to you is, I'm going to ask like four or five questions in a row, and I'll summarize it in one. So you said that these people who believed may have had a seed of belief in them, um, just a minute ago in John 8, 31, you said people could believe and maybe even believe Jesus was the Christ and yet not be saved. So my question is, what does a seed of belief mean? To totally, because my understanding with Calvinism and Reformed theology is you're totally depraved, you're unregenerate, God works a miracle, now you're fully regenerate. So it seems to me the way you explained it, and I don't know if this was an accident, but it seems to me like there's a half regenerated person. So like totally depraved, what does a seed of belief mean? Did God work a partial miracle on them so that there's like half regenerate? I mean, they believed, the Bible says they believed, but what does it mean when you said they had a seed of belief? That's my question. Give me Bam. Yeah. All right. Let me see something here. Um, I'm trying to answer some questions real quick. Um, so what does it mean to be a seed of belief? How is that possible? Yeah, you said in your last discussion that these people in John 1242, they believed. And you mm -hmm. said, hey, I don't, maybe they had a seed of belief. Like, what does that mean? Because my understanding of Reformed theology is you're totally depraved, you're uh, wicked, you're unregenerate, unle until God works a miracle on you. And then, only then, after you're regenerated, can you believe. But this yeah. passage says they believed. And you said, yeah. well, maybe they had a seed of belief. So right. were they regenerated or not? No. If they don't truly trust in Jesus Christ, they're not regenerated. Because people who truly trust in Jesus Christ, they repent of their sins. They, they count the cost. Like Jesus says, you're going to lose family. I came for division, not peace. I mean, it's going to be divided homes over this. And we've seen that. Um, so that's true faith and true trust in Jesus Christ. You can believe again. You can believe some facts and you can know some facts. You can even think, you know, what? I think he's the Christ, but I don't care. That's not true faith in Jesus Christ. That's just having some head knowledge and you agree with the facts. And But Christianity is not built on facts. It's built on faith. So what do I mean by seed of... Man, that's crazy. Look here in 1 Corinthians 3. So neither... So here it is. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. Wow. Look at that. As the Lord assigned to each. So you tell me the Lord assigned who's going to share with who? Wow. Yeah. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So see, I planted, Paul comes in there, he preaches the gospel. Maybe some of them like, yeah. Some of them said yes. Some said, mm. but he planted it. Apollos came and he shared the gospel again. Maybe he painted the picture better. I don't know how, what he, but he came in and he planted uh, on top of the planted seeds of, uh, of Paul. Apollos waters it. But like you said, I believe that it takes God to do it. Yep. But God gave the growth. They didn't grow 
and become believers because they chose it, because they did it. God gave the growth. So what do I mean by these people might have had the seed of belief? Well, because they heard it, they saw it, they saw things taught by Jesus. They saw him do some miraculous things, but man, they're like, man, I can't give up my, my title. I can't give up my job. I can't give up, man, I'll lose my friends. They'll be mad at me. They'll say this and that about me. So no, I, I want the glory from, from man more than the glory of the Father. I want the attaboys. So then we pray that God sends someone else to them, and God does. And so God gets the glory, and then they share the gospel, and then God says, now you're mine, and God makes that seed grow. God does it. So that would be my answer to you on that. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Um, so any more deals, or you want to go into the, got, the 30 I got minutes? Plenty, plenty of questions, but if you yeah. got a question, we can go back and forth. Well, uh, so here's what I would say. Like, so I want to go back to this right here. When you say define, right? Define Greek words with a lexicon, right? And, you know, previously I have a, a comment here where you said that faith is a work. It's something that you have to do, right? And then you jump over to Thessalonians. Um, you go to John where it's the work of God. And you say, well, then you go to Thessalonians. But you say faith is something that you have to do. Do you want to hear that? Or do you want people to hear that? Or do you agree? Do you agree that faith is something that you do? I mean, John 6, 28, 29 says belief is a work. First Thessalonians 1, 3 says your work hold of on, faith. Hold on, hold on, John. Hold let's on. just, John 6, 28, 20, But do you agree? Do I need to show the video of you saying that faith is something that you have to do? It's a work? Jesus said faith is a work, John 6, 28, 29. All right, well, we're going to look at that. Because, I mean, again, context context always is king okay and so it's when you're uh, right i'm just asking what what was that no i'm saying you're it's your turn to ask the question so i'm trying to be quiet no so here's what i would say with john six you know he just fed all these people right he just fed them he's the bread of life and then these these people who are there just for the miracles they're not because they trust in him and to be the savior of the world they just want to know, hey, look. So they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? Question mark. What do we do? What can we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. So this isn't the work of God that God commands you to do. No, this is the work of God. What? That you believe in him. Because that's what it takes. It takes God to do it. God is the one that brings that because we're spiritually dead, spiritually blinded. And if you're in the physical realm and you're spiritually you're physically blinded and you're physically dead. What can you do in the physical world? Nothing. I mean, literally, I had uh, a Church of Christ post posted this the other day. It was crazy, and he says, well, "Yeah, I'm getting to the question. I'm answering okay. your question." So, the the Church of Christ person put this on Facebook. He says, "When you decide not to be dead anymore," I'm like, "That's so sad." I mean, think about that. When you decide not to be dead anymore, because they understand that you're spiritually dead. But they don't understand what that really means. That really means you're spiritually dead. In the spiritual realm, you're dead. You're blinded. And so for you to have eyes to see, this is why, this is why everyone, even probably you, pray that God will open the eyes of people. Well, if that's not what it takes, why are we praying that? So here again, this is the work of God that you believe. That's God's work. God's work brings that about. So that's what I would, I would say to that. But you're saying that it's actually a work that we do? that faith is something we do. I'm Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you the question. John, I just read John's does is John 6, 28, 29, not what Jesus just said. They asked, what must we do? And, you know, and for the, for the record, in your closing statement, discussion three, you made this statement, believing is what saves you. Nothing you do. That's works. Anything you do is works. And you mentioned ergon. Well, ergon, that's the Greek word for works. That's what Jesus uses here. So Jesus says, it's this the is the one. This is the work of God. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? Believe. That it you believe what I just it's, said, that it belief. takes God. I'll tell you what it means. That's uh, circular. Reason. It, circular reason. Here's what it, it is. Takes. Do you agree? How about this one? For what we proclaim is not ourselves I'm talking about the gospel, but Jesus Christ is Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So what did it take for me or any believer, true believer, that believes and trusts in Christ alone for their salvation? 
what it take? It took that right there. It took God's mighty work to shine the light, so to give me the knowledge of Jesus Christ, because I didn't really understand before. I might have some facts, but I didn't really understand it. But it's God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It takes God. That's why God gets all the glory. Back to John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. They're born again, not of their hard works, not of their will, not on their free will, not their bloodline, but they're born of God. That's God did true. it. That's not what the text says. That's the assumption of what it means. Literally what it said. You want to look at it again? It says, not of the will of man. It doesn't say not of your free will. Not what, of the what, will what would that be? That means man didn't come up with it. The plan of the plan of salvation, God's gospel, man didn't come up with it. Not of God. blood, nor the will of the flesh. What would the will of the flesh be? Would that be works? You tell me what it means. I'm, I'm telling you. I would say works. I'm asking, do you agree with that? Okay. Do you agree I with think, that? I, you know, I would think that it's possible that it's referencing flesh like uh, what Paul says in Philippians 3, 4 through 12. Nor the will of man. But here, sure. we're just, I mean, we can look at. I don't Different care. To translations. Look. Okay. Translation. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, no, not so they were reborn, not the physical birth resulting from human passions or plan, but a birth that comes from God. That, that's how they did it. Um, that's basically, it that, that's basically what Paul says in Romans 10, one through four. He says, these Jews are making, they basically don't seek after God's righteousness. They seek after their own righteousness. See, these people, are children are born, not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor of husband's will, but born of God. So that's what I would say, that, saying that, that they, had, they had nothing to do with it because God is the one that does it. God brings life. He always yeah. has brought life. That's his job. He's God. Um, so I'm here's saying. what I, I want to go with you is that here's what I like to look at. Faith, baptism. So do you agree? So let's just look at BDAG, right? So you believe that you have to have faith plus baptism and that brings salvation, correct? Justification. Pers Just personal belief. Yeah, but we, we, we've established that personal belief, you're not saved with personal belief, it's personal belief plus baptism, correct? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to clarify what definition of faith, because you've got a, you do have a habit of taking what I say and then saying I said something else. Yeah, we can so, do that. But Mark, I'm just, I want to be clear, though. Yeah, Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. That's personal belief plus obedience to baptism. So that's, that is where your stance is, right? So if I go to what baptism is or baptize, do you agree that it is a ceremony? Baptism is immersion. So remember you said, um, here's what you said about BDAG, right? You got the Greek lexicons, right? Yeah, I like, that's fine. I like BDAG. Here you go said, forward. you know, Lots of bad arguments because, you know, comes from English to support their theological bias. But here you said, but you got a BDAG. It's a great one. We both agreed. It is the best. Okay. So here's BDAG. Just see if we agree with BDAG's definition of this baptism here. It's a ceremonial use of water. It's a ceremony. I mean, do you accept BDAG's definition? It's a ceremony. It's a rite. Yeah. That, I don't care. I, I, think you, I think that you're going to. Anyway, go ahead and play your word games. Go for it. What? I have no problem. How is this working? I'm literally taking the BDAG Greek lexicon, yeah. like you said. I'm fine. You with said that. you okay, but what, wait a second. I don't want it to upset you. I'm holding you to your standard. That you said we should go to BDAG to see what these these words meant to them, the context, how they understood it. So, I'm fine with that. go ahead. Like Roman Catholics, they do believe that that it's ceremonies and and, and sacraments that save us you know, faith plus sacraments and stuff like that. Now, I've always said that the Church of Christ is like Roman Catholic light minus the nice buildings and the Pope. But as far as traditions and as far as like ceremonies, like, yes. So do you accepting that it is a ceremony? I'm fine with that. Wow. Okay. Let's just look at a few more of these. Um, so water right. That's what Justin Moore called it too. Uh, here. Let's look at BDAG here. This is for baptized, right? It's a ritual, or a ceremonial sin, wash ceremonial. I just want everybody to see this. That this is what we're talking about here. This is the Greek definition of these words. It signifies the ceremony. Can I show a problem with what you're doing, though, by the right, for the word? So you're just scrolling through all these definitions of the way the word's used and acting like they're all the same. 
No, August. it's context. Context matters. I'll show yeah, you. So I'll say this. I mean, if you want to have a point, if you could get to it, because I really think we should, I want to get back to like the faith alone discussion. I just, I'm not, yeah. if you have, I if I had you're going, I'm cool with no, I want to do it. that, but look, let's do this. Here's a BDAG Greek lexicon, BDAG, which you said is a great one. I don't want to take it out of any context. Here's the definition. When it talks about a Christian sacrament of initiation after Jesus' death, when it's a sacrament, like an initiation, this is what Justin Mark called it as well. Initiation here, Mark 16 16, Acts 2 41. All these verses right here fall under a Greek lexicon of BDAG, like you said, as a sacrament. It's, it's a ceremony, it's something that we go through, it's a pledge, it doesn't save you. So, here's, here's Acts 2 38 here, Mark 16 16 in there, Romans 6. So that's what I'm saying. So if you're okay, I mean, then there's really nothing more, more I want to say other than thank you. If you just acknowledge that the baptism is a ceremony, it's a sacrament. And if you believe sacraments and ceremonies save you, okay. Like, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm done here other than I want to take you through, through some stuff here and, and ask you some really hard, hard questions. But anything you, you say anything you want after that. It's all yours. Yeah, you got the floor. The, the last, I mean, the last three discussions in this one are showing that there were people in the text who believed and were saved. And my whole thing I've been making for nine hours, 10 hours, 11 hours now, I think you'd get it by now, is that the Bible shows that you're not justified until you contact the blood of Christ. And in the New Testament, starting in Acts 2, those people contacted the blood of Christ when they underwent water baptism. I mean, Acts 2.38, Acts 22.16, 1 Peter 3.21, Colossians 2, 11, 12, et cetera. So I've said that repeatedly. So it's like, if, if your goal is to get me to admit that I don't think you're saved until you're baptized, well, I've been doing that for the last 10 hours. I mean, that's the whole part, the whole point of these discussions. So yeah, I believe that your sins are not remitted until you contact the blood of Christ spiritually. No. When does that happen? When you submit, a, that's when you're justified, correct? Yeah, that's what the okay. yeah that's justified. Now let's means just for, go to scripture. You said, remember, don't don't follow the majority. Let's go to scripture. Okay, so let's just look. You know, you remember our first discussion? I want everybody to listen to this one right here. Our first discussion, going through uh, proof text of baptism. You said you want to uh, talk about Paul because if we know how Paul saved, then we know how we can be saved, right? I would say that the song is Father Abraham had many sons, not Father Paul, right? So let's go back to see how Abraham was saved, if we can do that. And let's just walk through this together for everyone listening. So is this, um, is this a question or is this another, is this a statement? Are we making closing statements on faith alone or what are we doing? No, no, no. I want to walk through Romans 4 real quick with you and then we'll, we can close it up if you want. Then we're going to go through Galatians, you said. Uh, so here in Romans 4, okay, if you can look at this with me right here. It says, what shall we say then was gained by Abraham? our forefather according to the flesh. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So here's where we're going to go all the way back to Abraham, not Paul, right? What do you think it's talking about here when it says, for if Abraham was justified by works, what type of works are we talking about here? Because I think it's important to know that works are anything that you do, right? No, I would disagree with that. So the con if you want context, you ask what the context is. The context is Paul is writing against Judaizing teachers who are trying to add circumcision to the law of Moses. The same thing Galatians is talking about. And if you look in the text, the context, you can even see verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. It's talking about not the law of the works of the law of Moses, right? It even says works of the law. So if you go to verse 4, what is the point of Romans 4? He's saying... He's talking about Abraham, and he's going to prove the reason he knows that circumcision and works of the law of Moses are not required to be justified is because mm -hmm. Abraham was justified, Genesis 15, 6, before circumcision was given, Genesis 17, and before the law of Moses was given, which happened much later. So okay. they were trying to add can circumcision. I, can I slow you down real quick? Because, I mean, I know I'm, I kind of understand this stuff, and there's a lot of people probably who are listening that, that doesn't understand it as well as me, and I'm having a hard time keeping up with you. So sure. can we just take our time going through it? And we'll go sure. all the way through 27, whatever you want to do. So for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What works would he be talking about here? What's this referring to? What would you say? I, well, I would say if you go back in the context to Romans chapter 2, go to Romans 2, go to 25 through 29. <clears throat> 
because there's a lot that's happened before Romans 4, you know, so. Okay. All right. Romans 2.25, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. But if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become a, become uncircumcision. He's basically saying just because you're circumcised doesn't matter if you don't keep if you don't basically follow what God's telling you to do. Verse 26. If an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? He's basically making this point in these verses that leads up to verse 28. If he is for he is not a Jew, he's not one of God's people who's one outwardly, Jewish outwardly, physically, nor is circumcision outward in the flesh. Circumcision doesn't basically say you're a child of God like it did in the law of Moses. But he who is a Jew, who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart, it's spiritual circumcision, in the spirit, not the letter, whose praise is not from men but from God. So if you go look at Acts 15, which is a good background for this, if you go read Acts 15, the problem they have in Acts 15 is there are certain men who came down, and this is what Galatians 2 is talking about, there are certain men who came down, Galatians 2 talks about this, and they said you must be circumcised and keep the law of Moses to be saved. And that's yeah. when... Paul rebuked Peter to his face. So that's the same thing Paul's writing against here. So wait, he said, wait, I just want to ask you again, just simple, right? For if Abraham was justified by works, you, but, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What just plainly, you, what works would these be? You know, Are you saying you know, circumcision? Do you, I know, you know what I'm what, doing. I'm asking you a question. No, you're asking me the context. I try to explain it. And then you cut me off and say, no, 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 simply go to Romans four. It's like, you want to leave out the context. No, go, let's, don't jump over to Acts. Let's just keep going down Romans two. If you want to go through Romans two, all the way through three, we can, if you want. I'm I don't want to do that. I got all day. I've still got more questions about faith alone, but I'm, okay, I'm but, still going to go to Romans four. But what I'm saying is you can't ask me a question about Romans four and then not allow me to explain the context leading up to it. Because know, you asked I'm losing you. So when you're okay, so here it's talking about circumcision. It's of the heart. That's your point, right? It's not an outward thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm saying that's the problem that they had. The problem that they had was they had these Judaizers who were saying it's Christianity plus the law of Moses. It's it's circumcision. Okay. Cir so, so Christianity plus circumcision. Christianity plus the law of Moses. Okay. If, if if you, I mean, I, I can't. I wish I could sum everything up in two seconds, but the fact is you got to read Acts 15. You got to see what was going on there. People came down and they were basically telling, you know, Paul and Barnabas, they go up to Jerusalem to basically fix this. That's what Galatians chapter two is talking about, where basically certain men came from James, Galatians two, and Peter was eating with the Gentiles. But when he saw these Judaizers, he withdrew. And that's why Paul, Paul uh, rebuked him to his face. And that's where Paul goes into the discussion of, we're not justified by the law of Moses. We're justified by the gospel. Okay. It's the same Next. Gotcha. So just, I mean, just simply, I mean, if you want, we can go through two, we can go to chapter three, we can start in chapter one, verse one, if you want. But when he says this, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. What is Paul referring to here in works? Like, are okay. you saying circumcision? That's my only question. I'm not trying to trick you. Yes. I'm just asking you. So, so yes, I'm saying that the works in verse two, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. I think he's referring to the works he's already discussed in the context, which is circumcision, which was a part of the law of Moses. And if you look at Acts 15, Galatians 2, what was the problem in the first century? You had Jews who were becoming Christians who wouldn't let go of the law of Moses. That's why in Galatians 3, Paul even says the law of Moses was never meant to justify. It was meant to be your tutor, schoolmaster to get you to the gospel. So in Romans, in Romans 4, I think he's talking about Abraham was just was it was Abraham justified by works like circumcision? No. And then if you keep going, it, it, verse three, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. It was accounted to him for righteousness. Now it quotes Genesis fifteen six, which there's a few things to to I think the reason Paul quotes that number one, um, circumcision wasn't given until Genesis seventeen. So if you had Judaizing teachers who were saying, in order for you to be justified, you have to have circumcision, Paul says no because Abraham was justified before circumcision was even given. Okay, so let me ask you something. So you're Next saying is, is circumcision, was that, you know, when we talk about works, right? When we talk about works, which is, this is works. This is the BDAG definition of works. That which displays itself in activity of any kind, deed, or action. Do you, do you accept BDAG's lexicon? Is that the definition it has for it? It's got a one huh? there. Is there any more it has? Uh, it's manifestation, practical proof, That's deed, still or accomplishment. That's uh, one A, 
one B, one C. Deeds of humans exhi exhibiting itself in constant moral character referred to collectively. Yeah, um, I don't know. If, I haven't looked at BDAG Aragon today, but keep going. If is there a two, or does it go straight to the next Greek word? I mean, I need to look over that basically before I. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see here. Keep going. Yeah. See, there's two. All that right. which one does is regular activity, work, or occupation. So it's probably not talking about his job. That okay. which is brought into being by work, product, undertaking, or work. Okay. Sure, what, all, yeah. Anyway, I'm, I, all things are, we do, something uh, having to do with someone under discussion, the thing of a matter. So that's what that's what it is there, right? Um, let's see here. Let's just do this. I think it's Argon tonight. It's Argon. Yeah. So that's it's that's what it is. It's yeah, that which displays well. itself in activity of any kind. Okay. Okay. So for if Abraham was justified by works or any activity that he had a part of, that he did, that he was a part of, right? That did not justify him before God. Now, you're saying that this is talking about circumcision and the law, right? Okay. I mean, I think that's the context. I mean, okay. I, if, yeah, no, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. I, I, I mean, so was circumcision is it a is, is circumcision would that be a command from god that, that they need to obey in the old testament sure right i think i think so this and there and the jews understanding of circumcision was because they got circumcised they're now at peace with god correct they're they're, they're right with god because they got circumcised correct so i think i mean i know where you're going and i think that's but i don't think it's helpful so the, well, I think in the it's very helpful. i'm just going through the context no, because what the well, you're okay. Um, basically, there's two things to consider. I said number one that this passage references Genesis 15 6, which is before circumcision is given in Genesis 17. Mm -hmm. Secondly, this is not Abraham's initial justification. So it always like it always surprises me when people go to Genesis 4 and try to say, Hey, how was Abraham saved? It was Genesis 15 6. I'm like, Abraham's been a child of God since Genesis 12. <clears throat> in the discussion we're having, I agree. The yeah. yeah, you agree. Good. Cause like James White said in one of his recent debates or that I saw, he said, no, no, he wasn't actually justified till Genesis 15. I'm like, no, I think that's declaring what's already happened because Hebrews yeah. 11 says that by faith, he left her, right? He left. I agree. So and he that's faith what, and his faith propelled him to action. So what I'm saying is when someone goes to Romans four, three and says Genesis 15, eight, he believed and it was accounted him for righteousness. I don't think that helps the faith alone case because he's already been saved. He's already been saved since Genesis 12. Hebrews 11 talks about his faith. He by faith went out, maybe verse eight. I don't know if that's the right verse or not. So when someone goes to, Gen to Romans 4, 3, Abraham believed God and it was counted him for righteousness. Sure, I don't have a problem with that, but that wasn't his initial, initial justification. Which so, is why that's important to know because I don't think that that's what Paul's talking about here. Well, let's just I keep going down here. Let's just keep going down Romans 4. Right. So for if by Abraham, if Abraham was justified by works, whether that be circumcision or the works of the law, or could I in work? This is plural. So I wouldn't say it's just circumcision because this is works, plural, not just one. I would I would throw in there all the things that he did as far as offering Isaac as a sacrifice, leaving Ur the Chaldeans. Would those be the works that maybe Paul's referring to as well? I think I think he's talking about I think he's talking about circumcision because he's dealing with the problem of, I would think the Judaizers throughout the book, mm -hmm. because, you know, I do, in, I do agree with you that he is talking to the Judaizers, not necessarily the Judaizers, but he's talking to the church of Rome that is between Jews and Gentiles. And he's writing a deep theological letter to get them on the same page. So, but he says justified by works, plural. Now, yes, he mentions circumcision. So I would say of this plural works, then circumcision is one of them. But what are the other works, plural? I would say offering Isaac. I would say leaving Chaldeans. I would say circumcision. Any, all, all the things he did, right? So, but he has something to boast about, but not before God, right? For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, these works, and if we just want to say it's just justified by work, one singular thing, and we say, well, that's circumcision. That's what he's talking about. It's only talking about circumcision. Well, no, then, I would, is that? I, I would say it's. I wouldn't say it's just circumcision because in Galatians four he talks about you observe days, months, and years. Verse ten. So the right. Judaizers were not just bind; they were binding circumcision, but also right. other 
but in context, back to the context, Abraham was about 600 and I think 11 or 616 years before Moses. So he understands that these Jews understand that Abraham came over 600 years before Moses and the law. So he's not, I don't, I wouldn't say he's just talking about the law because Abraham wasn't under the law. Do you agree with that? that Abraham was not under the law. That's the point. That's the yeah. point of what he uses Abraham. Right. And because, Abraham. because Abraham's, because father Abraham had sons and many sons had father Abraham. He's the father of the faith. So Father Abraham here was justified. If he was justified by works, meaning according to definition of lexicon, anything that he took part of, he has something to boast about, but not before God. And then it says here in verse four, now to the one who works, who, who would, if we're just looking at this section right here, who is this talking about now to the one who works? Who, who is the one who works? I think it's the Jew, the Jew who is trying to basically say that they can earn their way, they can earn salvation by keeping the law of Moses. Because if you look at Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Paul says in, in chapter 9, I wish my Jewish brethren could be saved. And then he talks all the way to 10. But they, basically ignoring God's righteousness, have sought to make a righteousness of their own. Romans 10, 1 through 4. So, yeah, so I mean, but to the one who works here, this one right here is a singular, right? Date of singular masculine. It means anyone. To anyone. To the one who, to the one, whoever that may be, singular, date of masculine. <laughs> Right. Do you agree with that? Just contextually? Uh, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, I don't. Yeah, to I don't anyone. have an issue. With any okay, person. So you don't have an issue with that to, to anyone who works any deed, action, any task that he undertakes to the one who works, who does anything. His wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. OK, so we agree with that. Well, I, I don't know. I don't really know what you exactly mean by that, because. I mean, I think we agree if what you're saying is no person can earn salvation, then yes, we agree. But if you're saying well, that... Yeah, the because person, the one who works, who does anything, you see, Abraham, all of his works, whether they be works of God, such as circumcision, or leaving Ur of the Chaldeans, or offering Isaac on the sacrifice, all the works that he did, like, that, that's nothing to boast about before God. That's not what justified him. Here's the word justified. He was, was not justified I, by him doing anything. Right? I just think... I just think we're on two different levels with what the context is. Cause you're saying, so Abraham, I thought we were agreeing on the context where are we disagreeing because I'm thinking he's addressing Judaizers, but you're saying, well, I know where you're going is you're going to say, no, we're justified by faith alone. Nothing you do, including baptism. And I don't think that's an all in the context because Galatians is parallel. Galatians and, and uh, Romans are like parallels. Galatians is just, I think more compacted. And he talks about in Galatians two 16, you're justified by faith, not works of the law. And in right, that right. But, but, but look, it, it says justified by faith, not by works of the law. So how are we justified? By faith, not by works of the law, not by anything. It's like, like my boy, the dog says, Jesus is the son of God. He's not the son of Baal. Does that mean he could be the son of Ra? No, because no, it you, means he's the son of God. Said, son of God. Yeah. Son of God. Yeah. Qualifies. If you say right, he's so a son justified of God. by faith, justified by faith qualifies justified. It's the same exact phrase. But yeah, now, but, I know you're not going to say yes to it. I understand that you're not going to say, you know what, Trey, I just realized that. But justified by faith, not by works of the law, it's you can put anything in that blank because it what, unless, what qualifies justification by faith. And if we keep going down here to the unless, one singular anybody in the world who works ergon does anything, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as due. Because if I get baptized, just like circumcision, if I had something to do with that and it was my works, no. No, because look, if, unless, if, unless, unless you're wrong about the context, because you're the whole thing of Romans. We've been and, agreeing on the context. No, like it's, it's written no. to the. We're, we're not agreeing. We're not agreeing. You might have agreed with a few things I said, but what you think it means is personal belief and nothing else. And that's okay. not what I think. Let me about. walk through this and tell me where I'm let wrong. Say, let me say this. Let's take a break because I need to get another bottle of water and I'm out. How um, much you need? Uh, like How 10 much time minutes. you need? 10 minutes, ten minute break. We'll take a 10 minute break. Um, and I'm fine. We'll if back. you, if you want to stay here or go to Galatians, um, what time is it? Two forty two. because basically I think I want to I mean, keep going I, through, down Romans four real quick and then we'll do Galatians. But if we're not agreeing on the overall context, we're just going to argue. Well, I want to make sure we do, because I, I mean, it's talking to the church of Rome. It's a mixture of Jews and Gentiles. Correct. Is that yeah? Are we good just like so far? Just like the church in in Galatians, where right? So Jews, mixture of Jews and Gentiles, and the Gentiles probably don't have a whole lot of knowledge of this circumcision in the law business. Is that correct? 
No, I would disagree because in Galatians, it says that they're circumcised. They were basically the, gen, the Judaizers were coming in and teaching. Because the Judaizers were coming in and teaching that, but they didn't have a good understanding of it. And that's why they were duped into it, correct? So I, would, I think it's fair to say the Gentiles who were not, I mean, we go back to Romans 1 and chapter 2. Uh, Romans 1, Gentiles, horrible. Hey, Jews, you're actually worse because you had the law. They didn't have it. They didn't understand it. You did, and you still think you're doing it. So I would say that he's writing to the church of Rome, which is Gentiles and Christian and Jews. Can we, can we take a break and we come back? Can you tell people for 10 minutes what you think Romans is talking about? Can I tell them for 10 minutes what I think it's talking about? Because sure. I feel like we're just talking over each other back and forth. It's confusing. And then... So let's take a 10 minute break if that's okay. And then we'll come back. We can each take like 10 minutes to explain what we think it's talking about. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Back to this. I mean, I'd really like to um, just walk through this with you, but if you don't want to, uh, I can't make you. Well, no, it's not that I don't want to. I guess what I'm saying is I think what's going to happen is we'll go to verse four, verse five. We'll each talk about what it means. Go to verse six. And I think for the people watching, it's going to be kind of hard to put it all together. Whereas I think if one of us gives like a summary, I mean, if I'm going to teach through Romans four, it's going to take me two hours. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm just saying, you know, like for instance, where I work, we've got a guy who teaches through the whole book of Romans at 16 lessons, 16 hours or something like that. So to walk through four together, I mean, I just think you're going to say something you're going to, you know, verse one, you say, then I say, and then verse two and verse three, I think for the people watching, it's going to be hard for them to follow. So, yeah. I'm so I'm just saying, like the, just the, the simple, the simple context of it, though, is, I mean, we just read it for if Abraham was justified by works, and we look at what meanings are in Greek lexicons, that which displays itself in any way. So that would be anything he does, anything he does, right? And let's just say this plural word of works is just referring to circumcision. Okay, well, circumcision was a command by God that the Jewish people in the Old Testament had to do, right? To be part of the covenant community. Do you agree with that? I agree. Okay. So it wasn't his circumcision that made him right before God, correct? Yeah, because he because in Abraham's case, he was saved before circumcision was even given. Right, right. So and it had nothing to do with any other of his works, correct? Is it fair to say that it had nothing to do with any of his works? Any anything that he, he did? I don't think that's what it's saying, though, because, for instance, really like, says it. what where does it quote, though? You already agreed in verse three. It quotes Genesis 15, six. Right. Yeah. And you agree. You agreed He saved already. So our discussion that we're having today is when is a person go? When is a person go from lost to saved? Mm-hmm. And me and you both would agree that happened to Abraham in Genesis 12, maybe when he had faith. Right. We're, we're gonna, I, we'll, we'll keep going down Romans four. It's very clear. Aaron. It's very clear. And so. Abraham believed God and was counted him as righteousness. Now, Paul says, to the one, any singular person in the world who works, who does any deed or action according to the Greek lexicons, well, his Greek, wages Greek, are not counted. What? Go ahead. The Greek lexicons say John 6, 28 and 29, belief is a work. Okay. But you're not going to accept that definition, it's right? The work of yeah. God. So Colossians his wages two, are not counted as a gift, but as his due. He, that means he earned it. He did something and earned it. He did X, Y, or Z, and because he did that, he earned it. Now, and it says this, and to the one who does not work, doesn't have any involvement in it, right? He's not the one doing it. The one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Now, here's my problem with your thought and your belief that faith is a work, something you do, okay? I'm going to put this in red so people can see it. The problem is, if faith means work, although nowhere in any in the lexicon it doesn't mean works, it means to trust in, to have reliance upon, uh, confidence in, that's what the word faith means, okay? And so I'll just bring up BDAC real quick. That which evokes trust and faith. Right. Does John does John six twenty eight and twenty nine use the word ergon for belief? Yes or no? No, ergon means works. Yeah. Does that John six twenty eight and twenty nine use that word Greek word? Uh, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. Look up and look it up and see, because I would say that it, yeah, it's a work of God. It's God's work. That's my well, whole Colossians, point. It's God's work. 
Colossians 2 says baptism is a work of God. So whatever camp you put belief in, baptism is in the same one. But that's what you're trying to do. You're we trying to Colossians say, 2. So here's faith. It's <clears> firm <throat> commitment, true piety, which for our literature means being a Christian. According to a Greek lexicon of BDAC, is firm commitment, true piety, devotion. And it has all these verses here. This is what it's talking about. It says here, Luther's edition of the word alone in verse 28 is really hard. I put really in there. It doesn't say really but it's hard to contest linguistically. Here's all the verses where it's talking about being saved, justified by faith, which is not doing anything. It is true piety, genuine devotion. So here's what my point is here. If faith is doing something, if faith is truly, like you said here, I think I have it. Um, I think this is it right here. You said, well, it won't even show up. Uh, but you said faith is a work. It's something that you have to do then I would put in here in that in that phrase, and to the one who does not work, but works, right? Because believe and faith, according to you, involves doing something. The one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith or his works is counted as righteousness. Just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. It collapses so bad. So we can keep going down, but I'll tell you what, so you know, I don't think you really want to spend a whole lot of time here, but let me just show you real quick about this faith in Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith, okay, which means trust, confidence in, as he gave glory to God, fully convinced, not he did anything. Because again, if it's about his works, no, not justified. Not at all. He had nothing to do with his faith, his belief and trust in Jesus Christ and God. You know that. Convinced that God was able to do what he promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But this is why it's important to understand the context of Gentiles and Jews. Aaron. But, you, but yeah, but you're butchering the context because the context, <laughs> I mean, sorry, the context, okay. what was, what promise was he believing God? That he would have a child with his wife. Did Abraham, I mean, hope there are no kids uh, watching. I would say his promise is Abraham, gonna, the nations will be blessed through him. Verse 413, the promise, that, that he, the promise, verse 413, chapter 413, he would be heir of the world was not to Abraham or his seed through the law, but the righteousness of faith. Now, what what promise was it? It was the, the promise, promise that, is that he, all the way back in Genesis 12, when he leaves, he's going to be a, he's going to be a blessing to the nations. Yeah, but look at 19. Yeah, that's true. But what he's talking about in 19 did not consider his own body already dead. The deadness of Sarah's womb. He believed right. the promise, but he had to do something. I mean, we're, we're, we're adults. So you don't need me to. Well, no, no, this is this is what's crazy here. I want you to say it because like so what he did, although it was none of his works that did it, nothing he was a part of. But now you're going to say he had sex with Sarah and that's how she got pregnant. But he, he had sex with Sarah a long time ago, too. That's why he knew she was barren. So now it's faith plus sex with Sarah is what made him righteous. His faith moved him to do what God said to do. God made a right. promise. It, but when was he one. counted righteous? Why was he considered righteous? It was because it was faith plus sex with Sarah or his faith? Trey, <laughs> you already said that you agree in verse chapter 4 and verse 3, this is not his initial relationship with God. You know that, right? Like we're having a discussion about when a person goes from lost to saved. And you already agree that the context of Genesis 15, 6, he's already saved. And yet you want to keep beating a dead horse and talking about it. So like what I'm saying is because it's you, the Christian faith that we're justified by faith. Like that says in, here in verse one, justified by faith here. The reason why he's justified, it says that's why, why this verse right above it, because no unbelief made him waver because he believed the word of God and the word became flesh and dwelt among Jesus Christ. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That's why his faith was counted to him as righteousness, not because he did anything, because he believed God. And that's why he's the father of all who believe. That's why he is the father right. of all who believe and have faith. That's the faith of Abraham. He didn't do anything, had nothing to do with his works, which I don't know. I mean, I know you don't like that, but it literally no, says think, has nothing to do with it. I think what's happening is um, I teach that you're justified by faith. You just I know think, you do, but you, you don't use the definition that which about no, trust. I you say faith right. equals baptism. No, what you do is every time you find a word, you pull up BDAG and you scroll through till you find the definition you want. You use context to determine usage, right? So if, if BDAG has five uses, you use the context to determine which one. The context of Romans is that you're justified by the system of faith, Romans 1, 16 and 17, not by these works of the law of Moses, which is what the Judaizers are teaching. 
So if we're going to go back and forth for 45, I mean, what I'd prefer is that you do separate videos teaching through Romans and we've got some at GBN already. I can record new ones if I really have to. I'm going to teach mm -hmm. the same thing our videos already have. But like, I think what I'm saying is, I said this in the statement, you don't need to show me verses that say you believe. You need to show me explanations for passages where people believed and they weren't saved yet. And so that's why I'm saying like, we were asking each other questions. If you have more questions to ask me, go for it. I have more questions to ask you with regards to faith alone. And I just think we're doing the same thing we did last time where we get off topic right. and we're so let me just ask you, I mean, you accuse me of just taking things out of context with BDAG. Yes. Like, okay, here's here's what it means in Romans 4, 5. It means faith, trust, confidence in God, period. That's what it means. Here's the scripture uh, references I, for it. But I don't disagree with, I don't disagree with that usage. I'm saying I disagree with your use of the context. What are you, like, just because you say that, like, what, I mean, I really, for whoever watches this, please show me the context. Right. The context is, again, okay. you right. Do you I, go through the context? No, you asked me earlier for the context. I tried to explain it and you kept cutting me off and saying, no, no, no. Okay, just you go, I want I'm to mute myself and I want you to go through the context. I'm not going to explain it again. I want to get back to the questions because this okay, happens. Go, go with the questions. Listen, okay, I'll tell I'm, you this. Jeremiah Mortier would love to come to your church and do a live debate with you. Would you want to do that? I don't know. We'll, 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 think, we'll think about it. Okay. Uh, what are your questions? All right. So um, I already asked you this one. Uh, explain to me. So you're saying a person is saved by faith alone. Uh, can you explain to me uh, the parable of the sower in Luke uh, chapter eight? Um, because I'd like to hear how somebody who's a who is reformed, who thinks there's two types, you have unregenerate and regenerate, right? Explain to me the parable of the sower in Luke eight, mm -hmm. if you can. Because in Luke eight, it says there's four types of soil. Um, and I'd like to hear how you would explain that parable. Yeah. For one, again, before I explain the parable of the sower right here, let me show you the purpose of parables. Um, for someone who's not a Calvinist or Reformed. Jesus says, to you has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, right? So he tell, like, can you imagine that God said that? So here's the parable of the soul. So here's spiritually blinded people cannot see spiritual things. They can see the words on a page, but they make sense out of it in philosophy and, and rationality of a human perspective of a worldly way. This is why we have to renew our mind in Romans 12. No longer the way the world thinks, but think spiritually minded of the mind of Christ. So here's what the, the sower is. A sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed. Some fell along the path, was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on the rock, and it grew up. It withered away because it had no moisture. Some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears, let him hear. Now, here's the thing. When we take all of the Bible to understand the whole thing, that God is a sovereign God in control of everything. He, when he says, He who has ears, let him hear, he's, not, he's saying this to a crowd, and all of them have ears, I bet. There might be one deformed person out there that didn't, but I'm assuming the majority of the people had ears, okay, on the back, on the sides of their head. So literal reading, a literalistic reading would say, well, some people didn't have ears. But a literal understanding is saying, understand the context and what's being said here. Not everybody understands this. Not everybody will accept this, right? So, but you who do believe the word, right? So to take a theology out of a parable, not the wisest thing to do, but to make sense out of this, What's your question with it? First, what's your question? Okay, so my question is, maybe I'll be, maybe I wouldn't, uh, maybe I'll just help a little bit more. So in Luke 8, 11, there's four soils. Um, and if you look at the four soils, uh, look at Luke 8, 12. So basically Luke 8, 11, the seed is the word of God. So the parable is seed is sown in these four different types of soils. And then he gives the explanation. Now I would say this to your one comment. In Matthew thir Matthew's account, it gives the full Old Testament quote. And it doesn't give the idea that they're totally depraved. It says, verse 15 of Matthew 13. We'll talk about total depravity soon. I'm really looking yeah, forward but to it. A, but you made a comment. I'm going to address it. So you made a comment about, you know, well, it says, hearing they may not understand and seeing they may not see, meaning, oh, they weren't able to. That's not what the, the, full, the full quote is. In Matthew 13, 15, it says, the, the, the hearts of these people have grown dull. They weren't born totally depraved. It says their ears have become grown. They, their hearts are grown dull. Their eyes have closed. It doesn't say they were born, right? So that doesn't support the total depravity idea. I'm looking forward to discussing that. So in Luke 8, 12, 
explain to me how this matches up with Calvinistic or Reformed theology. Those by the wayside are the ones that hear. Then the devil comes and takes away or snatches the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now, this makes no sense, according to Calvinistic theology, because the devil doesn't need to snatch word, the word out, right? Because basically they're totally depraved. Why does the devil need to come away and take the word? The devil can't influence God's actions on any part, right? So why in Luke 8, 12 does it say in this first, this, I'll just one question at a time. So Luke 8, 12, how, why does the devil need to snatch the word out of the hearts? Because this says if the devil doesn't, they could believe and be saved. But Calvinistic theology doesn't say that. Calvinistic theology says what? Well, you're totally depraved, and the devil can't influence his God decisions anyway. So how do you explain Luke 8, 12? Okay, let me ask you a few simple questions. Do you believe sovereign and control of everything? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you believe that God more, has more power than the devil, or does the devil have more power than God? Uh, I believe that God has more power than the devil. Okay. So do you think God controls the devil? I thought I thought you were answering my questions. I'm the answer. I, gotta, I, mean, I want to yeah, hear you. Jesus answered answer mm -hmm. questions with questions. Here's my point. God, like, you know, you said you wouldn't do this. If, you know, God doesn't need to do this. God doesn't need to do that. Well, here's the deal. You're not God. Okay. For one, the seed is the word of God. So he throws it down, it falls here, it falls there, right? Then he says this, look, a lot of people ain't going to be able to understand this because it's so that they may not see and hear. They may not understand. So he says these things so they won't understand. And you're having a hard time understanding. I'm just going to tell you this right here. Who made the soil? Who made the thorns? Who made the thistles? Who made the rocks? Who made the seed fall where it falls? It would be God. God's the one that did that. God is in control of everything. He made the soil. He made the seed of where it falls. And I would say back to Apollos, but you know what? Apollos and Paul, he said, man, I planted the seed. Apollos waters, but God gives the growth. God makes it grow. So I don't know. I think you're, you're trying to use a, par a, a parable here to get doctrine and theology, but I would say that this is just true. I mean, I preach the gospel to everybody. Sometimes people receive it. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they're, they don't have nothing to do with it anymore. That would, I would say, okay, that makes sense scripturally. Some people say, I don't want to hear the word. I, don't, I could care less. That makes sense scripturally. But some people, they find it and they hear it and they take pleasure in it. And it produces fruit in their life. They don't produce fruit. Let's be very clear about that. They don't produce fruit. We're not, we don't produce fruit, Christians. We, we don't produce fruit. We bear it. It's the spirit. We're, we're connected to the vine. Christ and his spirit in us produces the fruit. We bear it. We just have these grapes hanging down off of us. And so, again, I would answer that question by saying, look, God is a sovereign in control. He's given us an understanding of what's going on because they don't understand. They're like, what's, what's, what's this mean? Well, guess what, guys? One day you're about to be on your own. You're going to be preaching the gospel. Some people are going to accept it. Some ain't. Some going to do this. But you're going to be successful in your ministry because that's what the sheep hear his voice. So that's what I want to mention when you mentioned uh, John 10. I want so, to say that so, quick. Your, so, is your answer, so is your answer to to Luke eight twelve? You shouldn't use Luke eight twelve to teach doctrine. Is that what you just said? No, I think you can give a good understanding of, of sharing the gospel with people because it's the seed. So, the seed is the word of God. So when you go out and share the word of God, uh, some people are going to accept it, some are going to reject it, some are going to do this, some are do that, but some are going to receive joy because the, when his sheep hear his voice, they're going to come. They're going to come. Okay. You're going to be successful in your ministry because my sheep are everywhere, and when I call them and they hear my voice, they come. Yeah, but Luke 8, 12, the question I'm asking is Luke 8, 12 says, so if you're fine with getting doctrine from Luke 8, 12, that's good. It says that the devil snatches the word out of people's hearts because if the devil didn't do it, they could believe and be saved. So okay. are you saying, are you, but Reformed theology doesn't believe that, right? Reformed theology no. says you are totally depraved and you can't respond until the, why does the devil that's have why to? I asked you, that's why I asked you earlier. I asked you earlier, is God in control? Is he in control of Satan? Does he control him? You're like, yeah, he's in control of everything. He controls Satan. So who's allowing Satan that's, to go in here and take not, the word from their not, hearts? That's not what I said, Dre. Okay. What I said is God is in control of everything. That doesn't mean he makes Satan do what he wants. Satan requested God's permission many times in the New Testament. God because allowed why? it. You know, why? you know why he had to ask permission? Because he's the prince, and there's a king sitting on a throne, and a prince can only do what a king allows him. And God is king. He's the king of all oh. kings. So the prince has to ask permission for anything he does in his world because God so eight, rules the world. So Luke 8, 12. So your answer is Luke 8, 12 says the devil can snatch the word out of people's hearts to keep them from being saved. And your answer is, well, no, he actually can't 
because if they're totally depraved, well, they I, can, I didn't say that. Like you said to me, I want to say, be very clear. I didn't say that. I said, yeah, it, it, that, you're not answering, happens, but it only happens because God allows it to happen. He allows that to happen so that they may not be saved. That's what it says. I can't, I can't hear any more of that. That's literally what it says. The one along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the work from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And I do know that God is in control and the devil can't do anything without his permission because God is sovereign. So somehow this this happens. But guess what? The, the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others, they're parables so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. I know you don't understand it. I know you, you're like, that's crazy. That's a mean God. God that I worship would never do I, that. I think, it would, I think it would help if he read the full quotation in Matthew, which is the full account of this, where, like I read earlier, in Matthew's account, he says, hearing you will hear and uh, you shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. And then in verse 15, the hearts of this people have what? Grown dull. The reason they can't hear is not because they were totally depraved, not able. It's because they have refused to hear God. And so they've grown hardened. Their ears are hard of hearing. Their eyes have closed. So that's an Old Testament phrase used many times to show stubbornness. The stubbornness is the reason they can't see and hear. It's not because God made them totally depraved and incapable. Okay, but still, so, well, aren't you glad that you weren't stubborn? Say again now. So you're you're a Christian because you weren't stubborn, right? You're a little bit more humble than, that, than those stubborn ones. You submitted yourself. Well, yeah, I read what the Bible said to do, and well, I they submitted. read it too. But their their hearts grew hard, and they just didn't do it. They were stubborn. But we, Luke, we are saved by Luke, grace through faith. This is not our own doing. It's a gift of God, so that we don't boast. But we're boasting. Luke, it sounds like. I don't boast. I don't boast to say I'm better than people. I say that I'm. Uh, there's four types of soil. That's what the Bible says. So check this Before. out, John ten. You said this right here. Where you're going through it pretty quick. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheep followed by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. You you made that point really quick at the beginning. I want people to go back and listen to it if they need to. But this is not talking about the sheep. The sheep aren't the ones climbing in the door. The sheep aren't the ones going in another way. No, Correct. the sheep are already in the pen. These are talking about shepherds, false teachers, that's false right. teachers, right? That's right. But that's right. I'm glad you acknowledge that now because earlier you made the implication that these are the sheep. and This is what we got to do. We got to come in the right way. We got to come in the right way. Well, this isn't talking about sheep the way you were saying. This is the sheep are already in the, 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 the fold. They're already well, behind the fence. So in verse, no, in verse three, look at verse three. The doorkeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When mm-hmm. he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them. Yeah. I mean, if you know how so sheep, sheep are handled, so them, look, they, hold on, out listen. And they come back in. The, look, I think the this point part of here is talking about false shepherds, false teachers. But I he agree. who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the true shepherd, the gatekeeper opens, meaning the sheep. So look, and then what does he do? Why is this? So to him, Jesus, the true shepherd, the gatekeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. Well, because why? The sheep are already in there. The Holy Spirit opens the door. Jesus calls them out because the sheep are already in there, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Okay, so again, I just wanted to clear up. I mean, we'll get to this when we get an election and everything. We'll go through John 10, verse by verse, but I don't want to do that now. But my point is, earlier you were implying that we are the ones that have to come to the door. We have to come in the right way. And Jesus said to be baptized, basically, was the implication. Read verse 9. Read John 10, 9. We'll start with here, verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thieves. That comes, what's that? Who's, who's John 10, 9 talking about? I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Who, who are the people that are going to be saved? The sheep. His sheep. And they go in and what? Out. In and out. Because the shepherd is at the door. And he's watching both. He's watching them go in and out. He's the shepherd. The sheep are in the pen. And then he, you can come now. You can come in and you can go out. You can come in and you can go out because you're my sheep. And that's, that's basically what I said. I said, basically, if you want to be saved, you have to come to Jesus, who's the door. And the way Jesus teaches is what you have okay. to be doing. Yeah. And there's other people who try to climb in and get in other ways. And Jesus says that they're thieves and robbers. Right. I, they're basically, that's I, just right. Want to, I just want to clear that one up. Um, so what else you want to uh, <laughs> look at here? You said you had another one. 
Uh, I don't know. Let me see if I got any more questions. I think that may have been the last one. Um, let me see. Uh, yeah, here's a question. Uh, how do you know every time we talk about John 3, 3 through 5, you always reference that you always say it is referencing Ezekiel 36, 25 as if like there's a as if there's like a footnote in your Bible. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously footnotes were put in there by man, but I'm curious, how, how are you so confident that's what it's referencing? So you would say it's referencing the baptism of Jesus. I'm asking you in yeah. John 3, 3 through 5, you always so, say this is absolutely referencing Ezekiel 36, 25. And I'm just curious, okay. what, like, have you read early writers, commentators? Oh. Where are you getting that from? I'm going to write a quick, a quick note here. I want to uh, ask you something. Um. So truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So let's just look at that real quick. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, right? So according to Jesus, before you can, I mean, you, you can't even see the kingdom of God. You have to first be born again. Yeah, I don't, before. I've, heard, I've heard you explain that before. I don't agree with that interpretation of it. Well, I know you don't, but look here, it's very clear. Unless what? one is born again, okay? Because it goes against your everything. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Why? Well, I think the Bible is pretty clear that we're spiritually dead and we have to be born again. Remember John chapter 1, born of God. Not of will of flesh, not of will of man, not of blood, but of God. They're born of God. So unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Born from above, right? This is what this is meaning. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? How does this make sense? How can I be born from above? What are you talking about, Jesus? Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You have no control over this. It's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all, is what he goes on to say. Don't forget that. The flesh is no help at all. It's the Spirit who gives life. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? So how do I know this isn't talking about the baptism of Jesus Christ? How do I know that? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, yet you do not understand these things? Now, why would Jesus assume that the teacher of Israel would understand the baptism of Jesus? Like, he wouldn't. What is the teacher of Israel? This is, this is John chapter 3. This is right when he begins his ministry here. Now, he didn't even tell the thief on the cross that he had to be baptized. And when I was in the church of Christ, our answer was, well, because he didn't have to, because the blood's only enforced when one who made it is proven dead, Hebrews 9, all this other stuff. But, but I had to be honest with myself and say, so you're, I'm telling people, he didn't have to tell a thief on the cross about baptism because he's minutes away from dying. But he told Nicodemus in chapter 3 at the beginning of his ministry, no, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Well, what would the teacher of Israel know? Well, he would know the Old Testament. So we would go back into the Old Testament and see where it's born again, born of water and spirit. Where is that mentioned? I'd say Ezekiel. 36, right here, God says this to Israel. It'd be really good if we had time to get to Galatians to understand this even better. God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. Now, spiritually speaking, not physically. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. Let me just finish real quick. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I mean, this right here is huge. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. Like, so that's what Nicodemus should have known. Like, when he, that's, what, that's what, what my, are you talking about? So, my question was, why, do, how do you know? You, you speak so authoritatively, you know, it's Ezekiel 36 he's talking about. And that's why I asked. And you did again what you did before, which is you just say that that's true. What 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 are you basing that off of? Because 
he could have easily been talking about, oh, the new covenant, because he talked about that which is flesh or versus spiritual. He could have been talking about the new covenant of Jeremiah 31. That's what I'm saying. I mean, I'm asking, what, do you know, at least from my study in Christian history, do you know the first place that that, that argument's made? You're going to want to say John Calvin, I'm sure. No, no, it's earlier, but it's basically, I mean, I don't know that I'm going to get, so I think, I think what I'm asking is maybe you would agree that you really don't have any other evidence as like, you know, sometimes when you look at Hebrews, it'll quote an Old Testament passage. So you know what Old Testament passage he's referencing. Mm. And John don't have that. You just have Nicodemus being told, hey, you're a teacher of the law. And so you say, well, hey, what would he know? The Old Testament. So, well, well, this Old Testament passage fits. Let's pull it over. But there's, you don't know that that the old passage he's even referencing. And so assumption. when he says, you're the teacher of Israel, how do you not understand these things? You're the teacher of Israel. We I'm, saying, I'm saying there's 39 books in the Old Testament. And what you're saying is you know specifically exactly what book and what chapter and what verse to go to. But mm -hmm. the, the Bible doesn't give that reference. I'm saying you're assuming, like whenever I hear you say he meant Ezekiel 36, 25. Well, how do you know that? I mean, mm -hmm. first of all, the Bible doesn't say there's no cross reference there as far as well, you like quoting a real quick. You, just to add to it, to add to that answer, Aaron, you Jeremiah uh, 31. Here's the new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. Sounds just like Ezekiel. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So this is what God does. God shines the light of the knowledge of Jesus Christ in our hearts. He brings our spiritually dead selves back to life. And uh, yeah. I think I think you're I inserting you hate that, a whole— You hate that, don't no. you? What, no, but what you do is you read a verse that talks about the heart, and then you think, oh, it talks about the heart, and then you insert all this stuff that's not in the text. Like, how did you get totally the law? If you're a Christian, how does a Christian get the law in the new covenant? How do they get the law in their hearts? In the new covenant, they're taught it. That's the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant. In the old covenant, well, you're the born covenant. in. Look at this. The new covenant says this. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and teach his brother, saying, know the Lord. That's so exactly said, right. You no. just said that you but teach it, but God covenant. says, if, no, not in the new covenant. If you'll let me explain it, I can show you exactly what I just said. I'll this covenant I will make, verse 33, with the house of Israel in those days after the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 34, no more. This is talking about the law of Moses. How, how are you born? You were born into the covenant physically in the law of Moses. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother. You were in the covenant. You had people growing up in the covenant. You had to teach them about God's law. That's the old law. What's the new covenant? Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. People in the new covenant, you don't enter into the covenant unless you already know, because you're taught. Once you teach, then you learn, and then you come to God. That's what John 6, 44 and 45 says, and we can get to that later. But the, the idea is that's the new covenant. And what I'm saying is when you mention Ezekiel 36, John 3, 3 through 5, and you say, I know it's talking about Ezekiel 36, 25. In church history, the first place that pops up <clears throat> is Origins First Principles, book 3. In chapter one, where he basically says, you have free will. And he says, but there are some people, he's talking about Gnostic false teachers that say, and then he quotes, as he, they say that John three, or they say, they don't say John three means it, but they say, let me read it to you. This is uh, Origins First Principles, chapter one on freedom of the will. And he says, on freedom of the will, with an explanation and interpretation of those statements of scriptures, which people use or appear to nullify it. Someone will say that in a similar manner, they who perish do not have free will and do not perish of themselves. The declaration in Ezekiel they use, I will take away their stony hearts. I will put in them hearts of flesh that they might walk in my precepts. Might lead one to think that it was God who gave the power to walk in his commandments. So what I'm saying is like, when someone says, I know John 3 is talking about Ezekiel 36, 25. Number one, none of the early guys ever taught that. The only people who, the first time I see it popping up is 200 and some years later when it's what the Gnostics are teaching. That's what I'm saying, man. I'm not saying you're a Gnostic, but I'm saying the origins of this stuff in Gnosticism influenced Augustine, and that's what has made its way down through Calvin and all the others. So anyway, I'm just saying, whenever you assert that you know John 3, 3 through 5, is referencing Ezekiel 36, 25, I'm just saying it's a stretch. That's all well, I'm how saying. How about Jeremiah 32? I will make with them an everlasting covenant that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts 
that they may not turn from me. So is that Gnosticism? Or I'm just reading scripture. God says, I will put the fear of me in their hearts. Remember what I told you earlier about 2 Corinthians 4. And they may not turn from me. Is that Gnosticism? No, because I'm saying that's scripture. I'm saying your interpretation's wrong. And I'm saying the only people so in early... So how do I interpret this? I will put the fear of me in their hearts, and they may not turn from me. So should I interpret that to say, no, that God doesn't do that. We choose to do that, and we can't turn from him. Go to Ezekiel 18.30 while we're no, there. We're going to do that when we, when we get to perseverance of the saints. I don't want to get on that right now. You just brought it up. <laughs> you just brought it up. <laughs> no, I'm just asking, what do I mean? You're saying it's Gnosticism. I'm just like, get, look, here's the scripture. It's very I'm gonna clear. Read. I'm going to read Ezekiel 18.30. Okay. Therefore, I will judge you. I, mean, I referenced this before. In one of our discussions, you said we were in Ezekiel 36.25, and you said, it says God gives you a new heart. You don't have anything to do with it. And you made the reference something, and the Bible doesn't tell you to get a new heart. It says God does it. And I said, it turned to Ezekiel 18.30. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways. Repent and turn from your transgressions, so iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you've committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit, for why should you die, house of Israel? So how does someone get themselves a new heart and a new spirit? By casting away transgressions, that's repentance. And they God gives them a new heart. I have no pleasure in the death of the one who dies. So the Bible, I mean, the Bible in Ezekiel 25 says God gives you a new heart. The question is, how does he do it? And Ezekiel 18 tells you. It's whenever you cast away your transgressions, you repent and you turn. And I mean, that's really how it's been throughout the New Testament and the Old Testament. Whenever you have sin and you repent and turn to God, then he forgives you. So anyway. That's the Old Testament and New Testament? When you sin, repent, and turn to God, he saves you? Well, in the New Testament, there's, I mean, I know what you're doing. You're doing. I'm um, asking the question what you said. I'm just asking people, what you said. <laughs> repentance and turning to God has always been something that God has expected from people. He's given different. And they're saved then, right? Yeah, I mean, the New Testament, Acts 3, 19, repent and be converted. Acts 2, 38, repent and be baptized. But it's so, repent and be baptized, not just repent and look to the Lord in faith. In the New Testament, correct. You have, I mean, yeah, in the New Testament, repent and be baptized. That's Although it says we've been justified by faith. I already said you have to have faith. But we're not I mean, justified when we have faith. That's, that's, but that's the overarching disconnect is you see a verse that says faith here, and you say, see, that's it. And I say, yeah, but this verse says baptism. But this verse says faith. Ignore that verse. This I mean, verse that's, that's, has a word, BDAG. Do you remember saying some of the things that you've said? Like, uh, I mean, how do you how do you define a Greek word? You define a Greek word by looking at Greek lexicons, which are like Greek dictionary. That which evokes trust and faith, faithfulness, reliability. You're saying I'm using it wrongly. Okay, so Romans four five is talking about faith, trust, confidence in God. That's what it's talking about. Here's in Christ. Let me show you all the verses it's talking about. I've, I mean, I've seen, I've read B Dag before. It's not like it's do not. Okay, look, so here it is, true piety, genuine devotion, uh, literally means being a Christian. Here's all the times it's referencing in that sense. But see, Romans you see what you're five, doing. one right there, 5 1. You therefore have been justified by faith. Yeah, but that doesn't ignore Romans 6 17. Like you see <laughs> Romans 5 1, it says justified by faith. And you want to say justified by personal belief before you do anything else. Well, then I go to what about repentance? No, you don't have to repent. What about baptism? No, you don't have to be baptized. Repentance is evidence of a changed heart. Christians, are <laughs> but in Acts chapter right. two, they had you said people are saved before they repent. You said that in multiple debates. Yes. You've converted. Regeneration so, yeah. perceives God changed our heart. Repentance is an is showing of a changed heart. So at least, hey, I, at least I know you don't understand it. Let's ask some. Look, I'm gonna get some audience questions here. How, about how that? is it? How is it that I'm the one that brings regeneration precedes faith in the fourth discussion? I know what Reformed theology teaches. <clears throat> I'm I'm 100 agree that regeneration precedes faith. All right, good. I think I've pretty much said that when we were in our other discussions. Where I'm like, no, belief, faith, all those things are evidence of a changed heart that God has wrought right. in so, us. So, so we got some questions. We got thirty. Minutes, we got thirty minutes left, and we said we had a fifteen minute closing statement. Okay, well, let me give you. Let's do some a few questions from the audience here. Okay, look at this one. Can you answer that one? How did I get an awesome beard? Oh, very nice. I like Jeremiah's beard too. Um, yeah, I know the answer to that one. So here's, I'm just going through them. I don't even know if they're for me or for not, you. My beard's not as nice as Jeremiah's though. So Here's okay. John Eubank. When Jesus is speaking to being born again in John 3, is he making a reference to all the promises found in Ezekiel 36? All right. Read that one more time for me. 
when Jesus is speaking to being born again, he's gone through the, making reference to all the promises found in Ezekiel 36. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is a good enough answer. I don't have all the all of Ezekiel 36 memorized off the top of my head, but I do know that at least contextually, I think a lot of that's talking about their promises coming out of coming out of Babylon. I mean, in 37, when it talks about the resurrection, the resurrection of the dry but valley dry bones is about them going back into Jerusalem. So I don't I know if it's, it's also about a shadow of our resurrection that we're dead, that God raises dead people to life, that he gives a spiritual life, that yeah, we're but I mean, dead. I mean, yeah, yeah, but Luke 15, the prodigal son, my son was lost, but he came home of his own choice when he hit rock bottom. But what was he before he left? The dad went out and drug him back. What'd you <laughs> right. say? But what was he before he left? He was a son. Thank you. All right, here we go. Here's John. You might know that? He was already a son. Him coming out. Okay, look, if Jesus is talking about Christian baptism in John 3, which can only happen after his death, is it not odd that he would, uh, let me get rid of something here. Okay, I got it. So John's saying, if Jesus was talking about Christian baptism in John 3, which can only happen after his death, is it not odd he would be telling Nicodemus to wait three years? So there are mixed, there are some people that, I mean, guys that I know that think John 3 is actually talking about the baptism of John, because the baptism of John was given to Jews. Um, a lot of the early Christians didn't think that. They thought that it was, referencing Christian baptism. And I would say to John's question, if you go to Matthew chapter uh, uh, 18, you've got instruction on church discipline, um, which seems to be given, you know, prior to, I don't know what it's for. Basically, Matthew 18 is giving instructions on how to conduct church discipline in the church years before the church is ever um, established. So I wouldn't have an issue in John 3 being something given that would happen in the new covenant the same way Matthew 18 is. In Matthew 16, the church basically said, Peter, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom, which is talking about the church in Acts 2. But in Matthew 18, he talks about instructions for the church that wasn't established yet. So okay. I don't know that. I Let's go to this one right here. Thaddeus Johnson. Here's what he says. Okay, I, right. question. I, I, believe, I think this is for you. I believe right. that Jesus died for my sins, confessed that he rose, and I was baptized on a profession of faith at a local Southern Baptist church based just on that. Would you judge me to be saved? Okay. So if he's, I would basically say no. Here's my reasoning. Uh, I would say this. Uh, it's good that he believed. That's what the New Testament says, that he confessed. But I would say if it was a confession, a profession of faith at an SBC Southern Baptist, most of those churches teach, unless it's a unique, I'm assuming it's the standard belief would be you're already saved and you're just being baptized as an outward show in, in, of an inward change. I would say nobody in scripture ever does that. In Acts 16, why do they go baptize in the middle of the night? Why don't they wait till the next day when the whole village is open so everyone can see? And I think that's because in the New Testament, like the Apostle Paul, he is, his sins were not forgiven until he arose and was baptized and called upon the name of the Lord. 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism now saves you, not the removal of the filth of flesh, but your appeal to God for a good conscience. So I think that basically when you're being baptized, you have to know what you're doing or else you're not appealing to God, 1 Peter 3.21 or Acts 22.16, you're not calling on God to save you. If you think that you're already saved, uh, Colossians two eleven and twelve talk yeah, about. Yeah, we got you. We got you. We got you. You're going to hell, Thaddeus. It's not just repent, and be baptized. It's also repent, and be baptized, and you better know what that baptism meant. So here's the All question. I, I had a question for you earlier. I forgot to ask you. Can I finish the Thaddeus yeah, question? Ahead. I'll try mm -hmm. to do it quickly. What I'm saying is, when I look at Scripture, I don't have the authority to change things. I'm just a messenger. First Corinthians one eighteen of the message that God gave, <laughs> and no one in the New Testament was ever saved before they were baptized when we're looking at the Christian age. And so all I'm saying is, man, Thaddeus, like, I'm not, I mean, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just trying to be honest. And I believe that somebody, when they're baptized in the New Testament, they right. had to basically know why they were doing it. And everybody in the New Testament knew why they were doing it. Nobody in the New Testament, in the epistles, why is no one ever told, hey, now that you're saved, you should be baptized as an outward sign of an inward change. Romans right. through Revelation, no one's ever told to be baptized. Um Although BDAG does say, and even with Acts 2.38, it's a ceremonial cleansing. It's a sacrament that we do. But remember this right here before we go to the next question. It right? does say it's for the remission of sins, though, in Acts right. 2.38. So pointing to what Christ did on the cross. Uh, there are lots of guys who make bad arguments from English to support their theological bias. I totally agree. I'm saying you don't make that argument from English. You look at what the word means in Greek according to a lexicon, and you go from there. And we, me and you, have talked about BDAG as a great one. So we have agreed on that. Uh, but remember our long discussion on Acts 22, Paul's conversion. I made the case that Paul was converted before he was baptized. 
We can go a lot in that. It's, he received the gospel from Jesus Christ. He received it from him, not from Ananias. First um, Corinthians 15, he received it. When he received it, according to Paul, from Jesus Christ. Um, on and on and on. Uh, all the Old Testament texts you got to jump over to say that he was not forgiven before he was baptized. All those things. But I want to look at a, you know, I told you that when he says, Brother Saul, say, you know, receive your sight, that he considered him a brother in Christ before he was baptized. And you were like, no, that's not true. You want to go to this argument? You want no, to I just want to show you this real quick. Look, and well, you can say whatever you want. Listen, hey, at the end you of the day. And then I'm going to respond. You, Of course, I want you to respond. And let me, before you respond, I want to be very clear. You will not agree, but we're going to go to BDAG. We're going to go to a Greek lexicon, like you said, because we don't want to get our theological bias from something else. We want to go to see what does the lexicons say in this text. Well, here it is. This is the Greek of Acts 22, 13, right? This is all the Greek words, okay? So he came, okay, standing by me, said, right here, said to me, what? Saul, brother, considers him a brother. What does that mean? Believer, brother, a male believer understood as one's own sibling in God's family, sometimes used of any sibling, regardless of gender, in God's family. So according to your standard, which is a good one, if we go by it, go to the Greek lexicons to see what it actually means in their time, what was their understanding, what is the meaning of this word, how was it used. I'm just showing you in an exegetical guide of BDAG, of a Greek lexicon, that that's what it was meaning right there, that Paul exactly. was considered a brother in Christ before he so was can you baptized. That, can you pull that back up? Can you pull that back up? I want to show everybody what you just did there. So go down to your set. Now look at that. It says Adelphi, okay? Uh, Adelphos. Adelphos is the lemma. That's what that. So since believer or brother, a male believer. Now notice what it doesn't say there. Notice it doesn't give examples in the, uh, as far as like verses. It doesn't say Acts 22, 13, a believer understand as one's own sibling in God's family. Now, if you were to go and look, here's how you I define it. I can show you all the times it's used like that, and it's all I'm times gonna, believer and a brother in Christ. Now, let, let's, I want to refresh people in the argument you made. We were going through Saul's conversion, and in Acts 22, 13, you said that the word Adelphos meant he was saved because you said there were two different Greek words for brother. You said there was Christian. You said that the word Adelphos was a different Greek word, and you said Adelphos always means believer. That's what you said. And I... Called you on that. Well, no. yes, I did. Right, you I, go back I'll say this. I said in the context this used and in Luke's recording here. That's what you, you turn said. the page. Right, right. If you, yeah. you, said, okay. you said in Luke Acts. I didn't say Acts, it's always. I didn't say it's always. You said in Luke Acts, Adelphoi is used. I have a quote because I have a whole note for it. You said in Luke Acts is your quote. Adelphoi is used for believing brother and aner is used for Jewish brethren. That's what you said. Oh, aner is the word for woman, for man or husband. So I caught you on that, and I basically showed you that in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, men and brethren, what is that? That's Adelphoi. That's Jewish brethren. Luke 8, 19. You said, remember, Adelphoi is only Christian brothers in Luke Acts. Luke 8, 19. Brothers, that's a physical brother, not Christian brother, physical brother of Jesus who didn't believe in him, Adelphoi. And then Romans 9, 1 through 3, which you're going to say, well, that's not, that's not um, Luke. But still, Paul uses Adelphoi. Of Jewish brethren, just like Luke did in Acts two. So, right. so again, here's what here, I'm saying. I want to. I want to. Right. You said there were two Greek words, and there aren't. It was wrong. It's a wrong argument. I wasn't okay. going to bring it back. You brought well, it let's up just, again. Let's just, if, if that's true, I, I do remember saying no. It's used different times, but the context always matters. Well, I always says context matters, and but not he's using it here. But listen, let's just let's just do this. I'm we're just gonna saying do that's what you said. Let's go to a, if we want to know the definition of the word, what it means. In its context, when it was written, was their understanding of the word? How, do, how should we understand that word? Let's go to that word, Adelphus, okay, brother. And let's just see when it is used as a believer or a brother based on the context from a Greek lexicon, BDAG, which is what you said you should do. Well, here it is in Acts 9. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, brother, which means brother in Christ. That is the use of that word in this one. Here it is in Acts 22. Let's get more times. This is when it's used in that sense. He came standing by me, said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. This is all the times it's used as a brother in the family of God. According to, 
according to your standard. Now, I know you're not going to accept it, but according to your own standard, go to a Greek lexicon. And we both agree that BDAG is the best one because it is. Um, and that's what you have to do. You have to go to see what the Greek lexicons mean. Otherwise, people are just trying to bend the words for their own theological bias. That's all my point was. So, so I understand you don't want to accept it. No big deal. Well, no, I guess what I'm saying is you and I, you and I both know, and I hope, I hope you won't deny this, but if you do, that's fine. You know that individuals put together Greek lexicons, right? Yeah. Uninspired individuals. Yeah. Now listen. Smart people who study the Greek and the history and all that stuff. I agree. And the, the, every book on hermeneutics that I have says that you never go against a lexicon unless you have good reason to from the actual primary text. Mm -hmm. and you all have to I, go against it every time it says faith and all this stuff. You have to go and against all it a lot. Is nothing that you just showed me changes what your argument was. You said there were two different words for brother. And you said a nair was one of them. A nair is not a Greek word for brother. It means man or husband. So you said that you know that Acts 22, 13 means he's saved. First of all, you have proof in the text in verse 16. He's not saved because his sins were not forgiven yet. No, so your if understanding so, of what baptism is is completely. No, if, if, Bauer, if Bauer, Danker, Art, and Gingrich, who are four guys who are not members of the church, who theologically likely agreed with you, if they say, hey, we think that Acts 22, 13 means that he was a Christian brother, you should not disagree with that unless you have evidence in the text, like 22, 16, that says Paul was still in his sins. Well, let's but, do this one. I know you're not going to accept it, but let's do Romans 5. Let's do an exegetical study okay. on Romans See, 5. We don't have time for that. Just, I, mean, look, I mean, it's just right here. Look, three, it's three, four. Justified by faith. Justified by faith. This is it right here. Be dag. Are we the best? Are we, are we sticking to what we what we trust agreed on? in Jesus as contained in the content of the gospel? Trust in Jesus, not doing anything. Okay. We're justified. Not doing right. anything because that would go against Romans four. That it's not by works. It has nothing to do with it. But anyway, what was your other? You want to do? No, I just think, I mean, I don't know the right way to say it. I think, I don't know the nice way to say it. I think you abuse, like, the Greek resources by, number one, by you made an argument. up and reading it? Trey, you, you made an argument <laughs> that there were two different Greek words for brother, and I caught you on it. And now you're, I know you're trying to backpedal, but I caught you on it, and I wasn't going to bring it up. Backpedal? No. Hey, what Bob, I'm listen, saying, I'm not backpedal. I'm saying, when I told yeah. you, go back and watch it. I said, here in this usage, in this use, I'll, I promise you, I will cut it out, and I will post it for you, Aaron. I said, I in this it, usage in Acts 22, in this usage in the Greek, it is referring to Paul as a brother in Christ. And you said, no, it doesn't use that all the time. It's like, look, I'm not saying all the time. I'm saying, but if you turn the next page, it says a near, and he uses it there as a family or the same uh, nationality. That's what he's meaning there. But here in but this text, not, it means that. The word, the word in there, does, just because just because somebody translated it that way doesn't mean it's it, the way well, the that's word what I'm saying. Like, is man or husband. So okay. all these, are all these right here, all these verses right. wrong? Translate wrong. All right. We've got 20 minutes left and we agreed to do a 15 minute closing statement. We don't have time for that. So you want to okay. do 10 and 10? Yeah, go ahead. I'll give you, you, go you got the floor. You got the floor. All right. So um, hopefully this closes out belief, faith alone. I really want to get to total depravity next time. So biblical faith is uh, the faith that saves is not just personal belief alone, but it's a belief that acts. It trusts in Jesus, not just in the person, but his teachings. If you believe in Jesus and Jesus says, do this, then a obedient person does what Jesus says to do. You can call it um, legalism. You can call it works-based salvation. You can call it bondage. You can call it heresy. You can call it a cult. Trey's called it all five of these things in our But just calling it something doesn't make it true. It's like the question you say, how many dogs, uh, how many legs does a dog have if you call its tail a leg? Well, four, just because you call its tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. It's still a leg. So just because you call the true gospel the apostles preached and all the early church guys preached, just because you call it legalism or works-based or bondage or heresy or cult doesn't change what God's word says. Uh, God's word never says that a person is saved at the simple point of belief it, in, in a way that contradicts other things, right? Um, I talked about faith was active in Mark 2. James 2.18 shows that the faith that saves is the faith that is active. John 3.16, maybe the most famous verse in the Bible. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever believes, believes what? Just what Jesus taught all of it or just some of it? You know, it follows in John 3, 16, the story of them bitten by serpents. And I think of them being bit by the fiery serpents. And they're told to go look at the staff in the center of the camp. And here's what the faith alone camp says. 
I believe the God I serve can save me right here in my tent. I don't need snake salvation. That's works-based. You all think that a pole, some snake structure or snake statue is going to save you, has the power to save? Sounds like a cult to me. Would God save those people? Absolutely not. Why? Because they did not, they said they believe in God, but they didn't believe in God enough to do what God told them to do. They had more faith in their own beliefs than their faith in God's word. Biblical saving faith, the true gospel says, yes, sir, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do to be saved because I know the power's in you, not that serpent statue, but I know that you're a God of your word. And when I do what you told me to do, when I look at the statue like you told me to, I will heal you. Nobody would ever say, hey, there's power in a statue. No, in the book of Numbers, there was power in God, but God made a promise. His word said, I'll heal you whenever you go look at it in the center of the camp. In 2 Kings 5, you have the story of Naaman. He's a mighty man of valor. He has leprosy. He goes to God's prophet, Elisha. He's told to go wash in the Jordan seven times to heal his leprosy. Faith alone would have been like this with Naaman. I don't need that, uh, I don't need that Jordan River salvation. The God I believe in can save me right here. Those people, uh, the Church of Christ, think there's power in the Jordan River. That dirty old river and water never saved anybody. I'm not going to do it. It's funny that that's what Naaman sort of started to do in the text. In 2 Kings 5.11, Naaman became furious. He went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, I thought to myself, he will surely come out of his tent, stand, call in the name of the Lord as God, wave his hand over the place, and heal my leprosy. And Naaman went away mad. <clears throat> Why was he mad? Why was he angry? Because God gave him a different way than he wanted. You know, I thought he would come out and do all this fancy stuff. And luckily for Naaman, he changed his beliefs. And he didn't think belief alone. He listened to this little, uh, he listened to the prophet of God, Elisha, but he needed some help from his humble servant that said, hey, if the prophet told you to do something great, wouldn't you do it? All he says is wash and be clean. And Naaman was humble enough to listen to the others who said, hey, look, God just said it. God's prophet said it. Can you just obey it? It's not that difficult. And 2 Kings 5.14 says, so he went down, Naaman, he dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child and he was clean. What cleansed his leprosy? Was it the Jordan River? Of course it wasn't. God cleansed it whenever he did what God told him to do. God did what God promised to do when Naaman did what God told him to do. The same thing in the New Testament. God has promised through the New Testament prophets to have your spiritual leprosy of sin <clears throat> cleansed in a similar way. That does not exclude obedience. John 3, 36, he that believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe in the Son, the New King James says, but look at the NASB. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. When we look at Mark 16, 16, people always say, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. But they say the second half doesn't say, if you don't obey, you'll be lost. But John 3, 36 does. He who does not obey the Son will not see life. Does obedience, is it pointed to in any other passage for salvation? Hebrews 5, 9. And having been perfected, Jesus, he, became the author or the source of eternal salvation to who? those who obey him. It doesn't say just those who believe. It says believe other places. So belief is necessary. It's essential. But this says to all who obey him. Ob obedience is just as essential. Listen to this one. 1 Peter 1.19. With the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without spot and blemish. Verse 22. You purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren. Verse 23. Having been born again, not of, of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God that lives and abides forever. What do you have when you put those three together? You purified your souls by the blood of Christ when? When you obeyed something, when you uh, had your souls purified by obeying the truth, 1 Peter 1, 19, 22, and 23. Not when you just believe something, when you believed and you were obedient. John 1, 12, we talked about that early. It says, as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Trey says, no. As soon as they received him, they weren't, they didn't give the right to become it. As soon as they received him, they were already saved. They were already the children of God because Reformed theology teaches that if you receive him, you are already regenerate because you couldn't receive him without being regenerate. So Trey and Reformed theology teach the opposite of John 1, 12. John 8, 31, there were Jews who believed, read the story. They didn't believe further revelation and Jesus called them sons of the devil. They believed but apparently, according to Trey and Reformed theology, they didn't really believe. That's what I'm saying. It's circular reasoning. Your doctrine says, well, if someone believes, but it doesn't lead them to obedience, they can't really be regenerate. Therefore, anytime the Bible says someone believed, but they didn't live a completely regenerated life in their say, they say, oh, he really wasn't a believer. He really, he really didn't have saving belief. John 12, 42 talks about people who believed, but they wouldn't confess him. Romans 10 says, to, and Matthew 10, 32 and 33 both say, to be saved, you have to confess. And these people believed, 
But Trey would say, well, they really didn't believe. They didn't have actual true belief. Trey says that they maybe had a seed of belief, which makes no sense if you're either you're unregenerate, totally depraved, or God's worked a miracle and you're re uh, reformed, uh, regenerated. The people in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, they were not saved at belief. They believed and they said to Peter, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter didn't say, hey, you believe? You're saved already. Peter didn't say, well, you're not truly regenerate. That's not a good enough belief. Peter said, repent and be baptized, both commands, which means they weren't just so the saying something they did already. It was an imperative voice. You need to what? You need to repent and you need to be baptized. Why? For ace, in order to receive, looking towards the remission of your sins. In Acts 22, 16, we spent three debates on this or two debates, which in a sense, we've had two other, the first two debates were on faith alone too, because if Paul was not saved at belief, which he wasn't, and Ananias was a man who was inspired working miracles, he told Paul he was still in his sins. And what did he have to do to have his sins forgiven? And a person is not justified until their sins are forgiven. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. So when, were, when was Paul justified? When were his sins forgiven? It was not until Acts 22, 16, when Ananias, an inspired preacher, working miracles, told him, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. In Acts 26, 27, uh, in verse 28, Paul said to Agrippa, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian. In Acts 26, Paul said, I know that you believe. Paul didn't say it's not real belief. Paul said, I know that you believe. And then he says, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul didn't say, no, 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 Agrippa, you believe. You're already a Christian. What did he say in the next verse? He said, Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but all who heard me today might become both almost and altogether like I am, except for these chains. He says, I wish you guys would become a Christian, but believing is not enough. The text doesn't say that Paul didn't, uh, the text doesn't say what a Calvinist would say. Agrippa didn't really believe. The text doesn't say that. Paul says that he believed. And so Matthew 7, 21 through 23, we've covered. Yeah, the demons believe, James 2, 19 and, and Matthew 8, 28 through 31. But that belief in Jesus didn't lead him to, teach, to, to take action. Matthew 16, 27 says, The Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. He will reward each according to his works. Your works do matter. As much as Trey wants to call it works-based salvation, etc. Look, go watch the first three discussions, okay? We've had free, three discussions already. It's not Trey's fault. Trey's a very smart guy. Uh, I think he's good at deflecting and taking the plane from what we're discussing from ground level and pulling back on the stick and taking us up to 35,000 uh, feet. But it's not Trey. It's, it's the doctrine. When a doctrine is not biblical, eventually it will trip itself up. And so altogether in our four discussions now, Trey has said that people are saved uh, before they believe, actually. He says regeneration precedes faith. So you're not even saved by belief. You're saved before you believe. Trey says you don't have to repent. Even though Jesus in Luke chapter 13 and verse uh, 3 and Luke chapter 13 and verse 5 says, unless you repent, you'll perish. Trey says you don't have to call on the name of the Lord, even though Romans 10, 13, Acts 2, 21 say you have to. And Trey says you don't have to be baptized, even though Jesus said it in Mark 16, 16. The Bible says one must believe, John 3, 16. One must repent, Acts 17, 30, confess Christ, Romans 10, and reenact the death, burial, resurrection, and obey that gospel in water baptism, Romans 6, Acts 22, 16. And 3, 2, 1, that's good enough for now. That was good. Bad, but good. But I love you. I do. But so I'll go. So let me get my still here right there. Bam. There I am. So 10 minutes. Yeah. Let me address some of these things. Um, first, I'm going to say deflecting. Deflecting. Now, I'm deflecting. Now, here's the deal. I want to show you this right here. Uh, Right here, I'm gonna mute my friend here. Uh, I'm deflecting, but when I bring up just what he said, he said, Go to the Greek lexicons, that's what you have to do. Because if you don't, you're just trying to support your own theological bias. So, I'm deflecting when I go to Acts 22. Because earlier I told him that here in this phrase, right here in Greek, in its context, it's talking about Paul being a Christian beforehand. Now, I can give you, you can go back and watch all the other, there's more scriptures that back that up. Many more scriptures that back that up. I don't want to spend my 10 minutes doing that right here. But how am I deflecting when I simply bring up BDAG, the Greek lexicon, that says, Brother Saul, receive your sight before he's baptized. And it means male believer, understood as one's own sibling in God's family, sometimes used by any sibling, regardless of gender, in God's own family. How am I deflecting when I bring up that word every time it's used in the Bible, according to Greek lexicons, but yet 
no. Like, I'm deflecting. Okay, whatever. So here is Acts 22, 16. Uh, you can't just believe and just have faith. You're not, you're not saved by that. That's what Aaron says. Now, Aaron's a very comes across very intellectual and very nice. He has a great beard. But look at this. What does Jesus says? He says, you're going you're gonna to go and you're going to be open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Now, Aaron would try to convince you that, well, that means you also have to be baptized. Faith doesn't mean faith. Well, all I got to do is look up this word right here, and guess what it means? It devotes trust and faith, full faith, faithfulness, commitment. You are, you have faith in him. Like nobody in the world, when you say, hey, like if, if Aaron's kid, I don't know if he has a daughter or a son or both or whatever, but if his kid was crying because he's scared that there's a boogeyman under the bed, and he goes in there to convince the child, that there's no boogeyman under the bed. And he says, look, just trust me. Have faith in me that it's not true. That's not true. Have faith. I'm telling you the truth. There's no boogeyman. I guarantee you, he wouldn't expect his child to do anything. It just means to trust and have faith in him. But yet, when we get to the Bible, all these definitions are different. And then when you bring them out in the Greek lexicons, like he even said to do, you realize that he doesn't want to go by the Greek lexicons. Let's go to Acts I mean, uh, John 3, he said, John 3, 14, I'm just going to address the things he said. As Moses lifted up the serpent, serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, he says, no, you should believe also, that also means baptism. Well, you know what these people did when they were bit by the snakes in Numbers? Let's see here. Look what they did. The Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, not does anything, not runs to it, not proves himself when he sees it. Just look, just look. And this, guess what we do in the Christian faith? We look to Christ on the cross. And it really goes to the doctrine of atonement. He doesn't understand the doctrine of atonement. The Church of Christ doesn't. They don't teach it. It's penal substitutionary atonement. And when you understand that, then you'll really understand the gospel, but you can't understand the gospel any other way. But this is what we're saying. He says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him, he doesn't believe that. Just because you say it, like we, everybody knows it's very, you just told a guy he's going to go to hell, even though he's been baptized, but he wasn't baptized for the right reasons in the right church. But yet you're going to say, you believe that? We don't. And it's, it's very obvious. Here we go. Uh, let's see, John 3. Oh, and he's questioning me again about the seed of belief. Like, I don't know what more to do than just give you scripture for it. Um, where is it here? First Corinthians 3. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the growth. So we plant the seed. We plant the gospel. We, we, go, we preach the gospel to everybody. We don't know who the elect are. I don't know. So I preach it to everyone, right? To some, guess what Paul says? It's the stench of death. To others, it's the beautiful fragrance of God. That's what the gospel is. So we plant the seeds. We go. And look, Apollos came after Paul. He watered it, but guess who made it grow? That guy's decision didn't make it grow. God made it grow. So... Um, another thing I want to address here is I don't want to get in James 2 with him right now, but James 2, the context, just read James 1 and 2. It's talking about faith that you see us do on this level. My faith in God will produce me helping my neighbor. And the only way you know someone's saved is by what they do. That's the only way you know that someone is justified by their works because you don't know my heart. God knows our heart. So once we have a heart change and God replaces our heart of stone, he gives us a heart of, uh, heart of flesh, he puts his spirit in us to cause us to walk in his statutes and to be careful to obey his rules, then we do the things God's told us to do. We repent, we confess, we get baptized, we help the poor, we do all these things. But you need to understand something. True Christianity, the gospel, says I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Religion, false religion, says I obey, therefore I'm accepted. That's a false gospel. That's the Galatian heresy. Um, so that's why I want you to understand, like, these words matter, right? So when God says, put your faith in me, like when it says this right here, like think about this, Romans 5. It comes before chapter 6. And guess what comes before 5? Chapter 4. And it says that it's not by works, nothing to do with works, nothing. It's on faith, trust. That's what the, the word means. That's why his faith was kind of righteous. And then it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. 
Well, either we're justified by faith, by the definition of the word in a Greek lexicon, which does not mean work, do anything. It means to trust. That is what the word means in a Greek lexicon. And that's deflecting. No, that's called contending for the faith, Aaron. So justified by faith, either we're justified by faith when we have faith, or we're not justified by faith when we have faith. But the scripture is clear that we're justified by faith, just like Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. So even if Romans 4, 4 is just talking about circumcision, although it talks about works, plural, okay, it says that he was justified. How then was it counted, this righteousness counted? Was it before or after he'd been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith. So the purpose was to make him the father of all who believe, Jew and Gentile. That's why he's the father of faith. Because why? Because it was faith alone in Christ alone. Faith in God's word. Faith is what saved someone. That's what saved Abraham. Circumcision was a sign to show the rest of the world that you belong to the covenant community of God's people. Baptism is a sign. It's a ceremony by definition right here. It's a ceremony. It is it signifies the ceremonial character in the New Testament. It's a dedicatory cleansing. This is what it is by definition. Now, if that, my friends, is deflecting just simply because I bring up his own standard, which I agree. I agree that we should go by a standard and look at the Greek words of these things. This is why I always tell people when it comes to the church of Christ, at the end of the day, it's going to come down to hold them to their own standard and the definition of words. Many pe preachers won't even answer the questions, what is faith? They don't even put it down. They don't want to write it. But Aaron was very kind enough to actually tell us that he's okay with the, the, the definition of it being a ceremonial cleansing. Well, guess what? When you're married, that's, that's a legal thing. You go to the courthouse, you sign papers. And guess when you're actually married? When you sign those papers and you give them to the, uh, the, the clerk, that's when you're married. Then you, you have a ceremony that what points to the marriage. Guess what baptism is? It's a ceremony. It points to the legal transaction that happened at the cross of Jesus Christ. By faith in him, you're justified. That's the legal term. So it's, you know, again, he says it's, it's a, a ceremony. He agrees it's a sacrament, which, hey, then don't be mad at me for going on cultish and saying it's like Roman Catholicism, because it is. Like, that's what the Roman Catholics believe, that ceremonies and sacraments plus faith save you and unto good works, because you never know if you're really saved. Therefore, you never know if you really have peace, because you could always lose your salvation. Who knows what's going to happen tomorrow unless you really trust in yourself and your good works. So, guys, I just want you to, listen, don't be scared to question your leaders. Read the Bible for yourself. Read it in context. Study. I'm telling you, there is freedom in Christ Jesus. There is freedom in Christ when you really know what Christ has done for you, and you understand that while you were an enemy— you were reconciled to God by the death of his son, not when you got baptized. But when you understand what God's truly done for you in Jesus Christ, it will change everything. And it'll be worth risking everything. It'll be worth losing your job, your friends, whatever. Look, I had a preacher last week call me. He just lost his job being a Church of Christ preacher because he's like, I got to get out. And guess what? He got a call Monday. Your services are no longer needed here. Praise God. Because you know why? You're going to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian. And he was persecuted. He was excluded. He says, consider it pure joy when people do that to you. I pray for Aaron. I do love him, but I pray God opens his heart and eyes because we need some help. So that was mine. And Aaron, I'm done with my little 10 minute spill. That was fun today. Oh, that was a lot. Yeah. It was good. How are you feeling? I know your, your throat was hurting. Uh, my, it's, my voice is it's going, but I'll be okay. I don't have to speak again until Saturday. So, okay. Well, um, other than I do appreciate it. <laughs> it was fun. So I guess next time we'll go to Galatians or Total Depravity, whatever you want to do. I'd love to go to Total Depravity. I mean, we could even do separate videos talking if we wanted to teach through Galatians or Romans. We could do it on our own. Yeah, but we can do that. But I'm cool. Total Depravity next time. Let me see if I, there's any other questions real quick. From the, we got 24 people actually watching. Let's see here. Mm. I got somewhere you have to be, so. Okay. If I have a question for you or me. If anybody has other questions they want to ask, my email is gallagher at gbntv.org. Say that email again. Me. Gallagher at gbntv.org. Okay. 
if you have a question for Aaron, email him there. And think about, look, the apologetic dog, he's barking up a tree, man. He's wanting to debate you on your home turf if you're willing to do that. So think about that. I told him I'd ask you. That dude's oh. tough, man. He's, he's smart. Yeah, I've, I've seen him on cultish in his other debate. Yeah. So um, think about that. Hopefully you'll do it. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching this fourth discussion between uh, Trey and I. If you made it this far, uh, maybe it's time you need a nap. Maybe you took one during the discussion. Uh, but either way, we hope that if you want to check out more of the discussions, you can check out our earlier discussions and debates right here. We hope you have a great day and also check out more content on the Gospel Broadcasting Network.